University of Delhi in honor of our most esteemed colleague and our honorable vice chancellor, Professor P.C. Joshi, who we hold so dear with gratitude for his unparalleled contribution to the department and also to the discipline of anthropology. I'm also very much honored to introduce our chief guest, Sri K. Rajeshwara Rao, Special Secretary of Niti Ayog, Government of India, and our guest of honor, Professor R.K. Mudatkar, the former head of department, Savitribhai Pule Pune University. Uh, she, he will be joining us uh, in a moment. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor P.C. Joshi, respected chief guest, Sri K. Rajeshwara Rao, guest of honor, Professor R. K. Madatkar, head of department, Professor M. B. Sasdeva, most distinguished teachers, colleagues, and friends. We shall begin the inaugural ceremony with the lighting of the lamp. And I now invite the Honorable Vice Chancellor, the head of department, the convener of the seminar, Professor B. R. Mondal, and the organizing secretary, Professor K. N. Saraswati, to kindly come forward for the lighting of the lamp. And after this, you may kindly take the dice. I request uh, dignitaries to kindly take the dice. Now, may I request the dignitaries to kindly take the dice? Marisa, can you kindly repeat it again, please? Now, may I request the dignitaries to kindly take the dice? We shall be now favored by a vandana from Ms. Priyasi. Ms. Priyasi is the daughter of our dear colleague, Professor P. R. Mondal, and I'm very pleased to invite her to the stage.
Now, I request Professor M. B. Sasteva to do the honor of presenting a bouquet and shawl to Professor P. C. Joshi. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to ask uh, Professor R.P. Mitra to present a plant and bouquet and, and shawl to Professor M.P. Sasdeva. Thank you. Dr. Vibin may kindly do the honor of presenting a plant and shawl to Professor P.R. Mondal. Thank you. I request Dr. Chakravati Mahajan to present a plant and shawl to Professor K. N. Saraswati. Thank you. Now may I request Professor M. B. Sajdeva, the head of department to bring us the welcome address. Good 
कम से कम भी कब्जे very good morning to one and all present here in this hall and in the virtual world thank you for joining us at the today national seminar on anthropology of health and well being being organized in honor, in honor of professor p c joshi our esteemed colleague former head of the department and now the vice chancellor of the university of delhi due to the unusual circumstances it is largely being held in online mode i on behalf of the department of anthropology university of delhi welcome you all it is my profound privilege and honor to welcome our honorable vice chancellor professor p c joshi who needs no introduction as you all know him as an eminent and erudite anthropologist our esteemed chief guest dr k rajeshwara rao ias additional secretary niti ayog government of india The, the guest of honor, Professor R K Mutatkar, Professor Balram Pani, Dean of Colleges, Professor Suman Kundu, Director South Campus, Dr Vikas Gupta, Registrar, University of Delhi, Professor Deepak Kumar Behra, Vice Chancellor, Kalinga Institute of Social Sciences, and President of U I A F, Professor K K Basa, President Inca, and Vice Chancellor of the prestigious University in Bhubaneswar. faculty members of the department and my teachers from the punjab university chandigarh it is a matter of immense pleasure for me to welcome all the eminent speakers chairpersons and co-chairpersons of various sessions my present and former colleagues in the department and scholars from all over the country our esteemed chief guest is a is an academician scholar and administrator rolled into one Dr Rao holds a doctorate degree in social sciences MPhil in national security MA in sociology a degree in basic sciences and PG in general Hello. and Hello. PG in general Hello. 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 is an administrator of his um, is an ias officer of the 1998 batch uh, batch of tripura cadre he is presently posted in niti ayog as special secretary and looking after prominent verticals of managing urbanization urban development skill development labor and employment etc dr rao was the chief of national health mission and prepared a groundwork and laid guidelines for launch of prime minister jan arogya yojana during 2014 and 2016 he was also instrumental in drafting the national mineral policy during the long span of 32 years of administration experience he served six ministries of government of india namely health and family welfare women and child development food processing railways vigilance and mines and two state governments namely tripura and andhra pradesh dr rao conceptualized and implemented several development projects supported by bilateral and multilateral organizations he has been an ardent practitioner of a consensus based and comprehensive approach for addressing complex challenges professor r k mutatko today's chief guest of honor today guest of honor is a direct student of professor s dubey and a colleague of colleague to none other than professor iravati karbe he was the first head of the department of anthropology and professor and Professor in charge, Professor Director of the Interdisciplinary School of Health Sciences, University of Pune. He has been Chairman of Indian National Confederation and Academy of Anthropologists, INCA. He established an academic institution, the Maharashtra Association of Anthropological Sciences, in 1976, and is the patron of Society for Indian Medical Association, Medical Anthropology. He initiated research on social aspects of leprosy at WHO Geneva in 1981. He chaired the first working group of an issue in public health for the 11th five-year plan. He chaired the first scientific advisory group of the Social Behavioral Research Division at the ICMR. He has been recipient of the Gold National Scholarship bestowed by Ministry of Culture, Government of India. Professor Mutatko has been honored with the International Gandhi Award for Leprosy by Honorable Vice President of India and Adivasi Sevak Puraskar by the Governor of Maharashtra. he has published a large number of books 
which was published in uh, his recent books are A Use in Public Health, which was published in two volumes, then Driver Health and Malnutrition, Sexuality and Sexual Behavior, Social Sciences Perspective, and the most recent one is Anthropological Paradigm for Policy and Practice. The Department of Anthropology at the University of Delhi was founded in 1947 with the sole aim of undertaking holistic research and teaching in different aspects of human life. We always make efforts to match the vision of the founding fathers of this department that, in, that is enhancing the well-being of the people belonging to the diverse cultures and societies in the rapidly changing environments. Currently, we have around 300 students of anthropology in our undergraduate postgraduate courses, and approximately 90 students in MSc Forensic Science. Besides this, we are running a certificate course in Forensic Science since 1968. We have produced more than 400 PhD degree holders and a much larger number of MPhil scholars. The hardworking faculty of the department is currently working on the wide range of challenging issues related to public health, human physiology, epidemiology, genetics, and epigenetics on one hand, to the marginalized societies, gender and economic inequalities, inequalities and psychological problems on the other, and are constantly communicating their research findings in high impact journals. Students trained in our department have not only founded various academic departments and centers across the country, but are also carrying forward the exam exemplary traditions of the University of Delhi therein. Our department has always been the leader declaring the agenda of research and teaching for others. And with the efforts of my colleagues who constitute the teaching faculty, I'm sure the glorious status of the department continues and will continue to be so in future. Nothing is static in this world. Like any other discipline, anthropology has to keep pace with the changing society and culture. Changes of vast magnitude and repercussions are taking place in the world today. These challenges, force us to critically review our theories, concepts, practices, methodological approaches, conclusions, and the agendas of research and teaching. Anthropology is prepared to face these challenges and contribute meaningfully and realistically to a better, honorable, decent, and dignified living for all of on this biosphere. I'm sure this two-day seminar will be a fruitful exercise where the experts of anthropology working at the interface of health and well-being culture research, policy and practice will paint a wide canvas. I'm sure the academic deliberations during this seminar will open new avenues and vistas for research and collaborations. I once again, thank you all for your gracious presence. Thank you so much, sir. Now I invite Professor B.R. Mondal, the convener of this seminar, to give the introductory remarks about the conference. Good morning to all of you. Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor P.C. Joshi, our chief guest, Dr. K. Rajeshwara Rao, our guest of honor, Professor R.K. Mutatkar, Professor K. Behera, Professor K.K. K. Misra, Professor K.K. K. Basha, Professor Salina Mehta, Professor Mitasri Mitra, Professor I.S. Marwa, Professor Indu Talwar, Professor Sunita Reddy, Professor Balaram Pani, Dean of Colleges, Delhi University, Professor Suman Kundu, Director, South Campus of Delhi University, Dr. Bikas Gupta, Registrar, Delhi University, and other distinguished scholar. On behalf of the Department of Anthropology, University of Delhi, as a convener, I am privileged to welcome you all in this two days virtual national seminar on 
anthropology of health and well-being to honor Professor P.C. Joshi for his superannuation from this department on 31st May 2021. With the modern human, Homo sapiens sapiens, so-called, appeared on Earth nearly 40,000 years BP and constantly facing different challenges and struggling continuously to maintain our own existence on this planet. Today, the entire world is affected by the coronavirus and nearly 3.75 million people are dead all over the world due to coronavirus disease. Therefore, nowadays, no other topic would be so glorious and appropriate other than anthropology of health and well-being. In fact, this is not only a topic, but also an important issue for all human beings, which needs to be discussed thoroughly. There is a very old saying that health is wealth, where health is a state of being and wellness is a state of living a healthy lifestyle. WHO defined health as a complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, while wellness aims to enhance well-being. Truly, health is the goal and wellness is the active process of achieving it. In fact, staying healthy and wellness is important. It makes us feel better we become more productive and ultimately we live longer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Our guest of honor, Professor R.K. Murdatkar, is a well-known medical anthropologist. And as we have already heard in the welcome address, he is indeed a true leader in many areas. I would not repeat reading out his enormous credentials again, as we have already been told. Mm -hmm. We are very glad to have you, sir. And now, ladies and gen gentlemen, please join with me in inviting our guest of honor, Professor R.K. Mudatkar, to deliver his speech. Please, sir. Hello, Professor P. Shitoshi, chief guest, other guest, colleagues and students. I feel privileged today to be associated with the felicitation of Professor Pish Doshi, whom I know for the last 43 years since the post ICAES Symposium on Medical Anthropology at Pune University in 1978. As we experience, academics do not retire from work since they do not feel tired. Actually, their real flowering of creative work based on their experience starts later. The teachers also live through their students and colleagues, the proof of which is in the volume being released in honor of Professor P. Toshi. Since I was honored to write the foreword for the book, I would not repeat what has already been presented in the book. I would like to give some examples. Now, starting with the COVID pandemic, the COVID pandemic might have numbed our movements, but has triggered our minds to reflect on the optimism and assurance of science about the role of vaccines, since we are used to experience smallpox vaccine as a role model. The healthy people are helplessly prevented from doing gainful work, leading to migrations and reverse migrations. And we discuss health in terms of our capacities to perform our social and economic roles as per ascribed and acute statuses. It is these roles that get denied to perform for millions of people across the countries to contain the risk of large scale mortality. That is the pandemic. So we tend to accept human species as a uniform biological entity on the basis of morbidity and mortality data without analyzing the several epidemiological variables such as demography, age, sex, literacy levels, occupation, class, ethnic groups, rural urban variables, density of population, health culture, food habits, 
addictions such as tobacco and alcohol, fish and spices such as turmeric, ginger, garlic, and many more as traditional immunity boosters, social interactions, house types, and many others. We are presented with district-wide data, district being a revenue unit created by the British, which has relevance to health only in terms of healthcare facilities in the public, private, and voluntary sector subjected to certain rules and regulations. There are several taluks or tehsils in a district with taluk towns, uh, highly grown as crowded places with growing markets. The urban data is presented as if a city or a town is a homogeneous unit, which even villages are composed by caste localities and tribal villages by ethnic group hamlets. So our universal data leads to questionable actions besides developing psychosis. When the first case of HIV were identified in Chennai, I happened to be present for a UNICEF meeting about leprosy among children. The Director General of Health Services from Delhi, who came to inaugurate our meeting, commenting on HIV said, let us scare people to death so that they do not indulge in unprotected sex. This is the surest way for symptomatic people to go in hiding. On 27th May, that is day before yesterday, I received a tribal tour report in the context of COVID from the Commissioner of Tribal Development Corporation Maharashtra for my informal feedback. He had gone to some tribal pockets inhabited by PVTG Katkari, among whom about 80% migrate, migrate for the major part of the year to make living. Due to lockdown, they have been back home without anything to survive. The Tribal Development Corporation offered some money to form self-help groups to collect the traditional medicinal herbs like Giro or Guruchi and to do their preliminary processing since that is in great demand from the Ayurvedic pharmaceuticals as immunity boosters during COVID. The women had heard about COVID with flu-like symptoms, which they said could manage with their traditional herbs. Going to the hospital meant inviting death, as also vaccination, having heard from some stories about the non-tribals getting afflicted despite vaccination. Coming to our health sciences, we have health sciences universities across the country affiliating medical colleges from plural systems of medicine. In these colleges, we discuss diseases, their symptoms, and their treatment with drugs. We do not discuss health. Preventive and social medicine is not a desirable subject in any system of medicine. How to prevent the preventive medicine is students' favorite slogan. When we established School of Health Sciences at Pune University, under the interdisciplinary UGC program, Health Sciences University in Maharashtra wanted us to be affiliated to them we had to educate them that we were not doing any clinical work nor running a hospital. Coming from anthropology department under social science faculty in our university, I was shifted to science faculty as the first head of the School of Health Sciences. Dr. Banmohan Singh, during his brief spell as UGC chairman, coming from Reserve Bank of India before he became finance minister and later prime minister, gave us the three faculty positions and a building with one request letter from Professor P.V. Sukhatme by return of post without any UGC committee looking into the request. Professor Sukhatme, pioneer agricultural statistician with FAO Rome for 25 years, understood poverty and nutrition and the international market economics of protein deficiency versus calorie deficiency from which the poor engaged in manual labor suffered. Yeah. If a worker required four thick bhakri or roti made of millets, eating with thick curry of pulses or onion or with a crushed mixture of green chili and salt, his protein and calorie requirements may be met, provided he could get so many rotis for himself and his family out of his wages. Now in anthropology, the classical ethnography of tribal or isolated island communities did not discuss health as a distinct research issue. The food in relation to production or consumption rituals, ceremonies and festivals was documented. The traditional healthcare professionals like Dai 
shamans and vaidu herbalists and their indigenous knowledge have been documented as ethnomedicine the anthropological concepts of great and little tradition have been found useful in establishing the relationship of local health traditions with textual medicine like ayurveda now we anthropologists are invited to join disease control programs with an agenda to tell the pre-literate illiterate people having faith in superstition to follow and comply with the drug regimen instructions advised by the program as ultimate truth in the name of science that is called health education renamed as information education communication and now rechristened as behavioral change communication in anthropology today the encyclopedic classic volume edited by Grover there is a paper which says that in America magic is sold in the name of science we have learned from them quite late our toothbrushes emit healthy rays lately the pill use toothpaste detergents and cosmetics have spices and lemons and neem and such other traditional herbs in Chennai, I found the ladies in a building collecting neem flowers from their compound to mix them with in rasam. A lady vendor shouting to sell leafy vegetables was also selling a vegetable as brain tonic, the leaves of Brahmi. The Brahmi capsules are now promoted as brain tonic by government pharmacy. During dengue epidemic in Chennai, the then lady chief minister allowed naturopathy college to use extracts of papaya leaves for cure. Now it is prescribed in allopathic hospitals also and have been turned into capsules. We may have several examples of this sort in our medicine, but there is an issue of evidence about publication in peer-reviewed international journals without which it is quackery. What evidence is there? The turmeric, ginger or garlic or asafoetida hing are good herbs and spices. Why was Columbus heading for India in search of black gold of Kerala if not to address the problem of continuing constipation in the West? Recently, the concept of reverse pharmacology has been advocated, whereby these herbs found useful by people should not be branded as unscientific. The laboratory scientists are free to analyze them for their active principles, but should not use veto in the name of modern medicine. Actually, the claim is that it is not the active principle alone which works and if it is turned into a synthetic drug, it would have side effects. If it is used as a whole herb as given by nature, it may have side benefits. Anthropology, practiced as holistic science of man, is useful like an integrated whole herb. I have another piece on science from top international scientists. I happen to be one invitee among the 12 scientists dealing with leprosy as molecular biologists, immunologists, epidemiologists, pharmacists and the like at Pontifical Academy of Sciences Vatican for a week after the International Leprosy Congress at Delhi in 1984. I was the only black or brown representing social sciences. The senior scientists were friends of each other but they happened to differ on recommending a research agenda going from the academy, which had serious social implications due to social stigma of leprosy. I was asked to resolve the matter, convincing that the research interests exploring man animal transmission in leprosy as a recommendation from Vatican would jeopardize the control program and further promote the stigma and fear. I said, it was not a good strategy to attract research funds on a topic of one scientist's interest from the Vatican platform. In that context, the scientists educated me that science was 30% science and 70% commerce. Another experience from Pennsylvania Medical School, where I was invited to negotiate School of Health Sciences, collaborating with them, one professor of obstetrics and gynecology in his presentation about research uh, on a microbicide which could be use, useful or used as a contraceptive and also prevent HIV infection concluded saying that there was a lot of money in it. I only remarked that in India 
we did not have a concept of bedroom. We have similar issues about Indian Council of Agriculture Research and Indian Council of Medical Research. Due to pressure from MS Swaminathan from the Planning Commission with tribal development as a 20 point political program of the then ruling party, agricultural universities were asked to look into tribal agriculture. I was welcomed as an anthropologist considered to be expert on tribal issues. I pointed out that their research institutes, institutes were given in crops, given to crops and animals such as wheat or rice research center, goat or camel research center. My priority has been a common man or a tribal community. Where do we meet? Unless they change their orientation towards people, nothing worthwhile would come. Whose, whose research agenda is farmer suicide or tribal malnutrition? Similarly, in ICMR, the research institutes are given to diseases such as cancer, TB, TB leprosy, HIV, AIDS, etc. That is concerned with the agents such as vectors, viruses, bacilli, etc., not the host man in their epidemiological trial. I happen to tell the director of Vector Research Institute that they knew more about the lifestyle of mosquito than of man, about the biting habits early morning, afternoon, evening, etc. They reach vertically and horizontally, singing and non-singing, etc. He remarked, the mosquito knew the lifestyle of man, he followed the man and we followed the mosquito. J.P. Naik, the member secretary of Kothari Commission on Education, the architect of ICSSR, and the author of ICSSR ICMR Joint Report on Health for All, which influenced the formulation of the first national health policy, shared in a research meeting at the BJ Medical College Pune, where I was present. He said, how many of us should be sick for a doctor to make his living? He happened to be present at an international conference of pharma industry in US. They were discussing that the consumption of drugs in the third world was far less as compared to their first world country. So there was scope to increase the consumption in the third world. In the third world. JP Naik asked, suppose the third world decided not to fall sick and remain healthy, what would happen? The answer was that would be catastrophic for the industry. I would like to give an example about our qualitative methods. The International Institute of Population Sciences, IIBS Mumbai, presented a report that fertility in Goa was lowest in India. Minister of Health, who was an ex officio chairman of the governing council, ruled that India's population problem was solvable by following the Goa model. But what was the model? They had statistics, but no explanation about the number. We launched qualitative studies in four villages in Goa under the leadership of, of our anthropology student. Average age at marriage of girls was 27, 27 years. But why? Girls' education was good. But why? Recruitment to church clergy was high. Migration of girls within India and to other Portuguese colonies was high. Most important, the Portuguese property rules as made applicable in Goa were women friendly. One of the, in one of the women's meetings where I was present, Muslim women said they neither wanted Sharia nor Indian civil law. They were happy with the Portuguese civil law in Goa. So the statistics or the number could speak with assistance of our qualitative methods. Anthropology has an answer to the question, why this behavior, not how many. There are cultural issues in mental health concepts. There are mental there are issues in mental health. As you know, concepts of culture, personality, basic personality configuration were jointly developed by anthropologists and psychiatrists. A very prominent psychiatrist at Pune, who was professor of psychiatry in the medical college, the dean of mental hospital, and post-retirement private practitioner told me he was earning lots of money dealing with abnormal behavior without knowing what was normal behavior. He wanted anthropology to tell them what was normal behavior. Talking about disaster and mental health, 
There was a massive earthquake in Latur, commonly known as Pillari earthquake in Maratwara region of Maharashtra in 1993 at 4 a.m. when 10,000 people perished in a fraction of a second house, because houses collapsed on them in sleep. ICMR launched a mental health study. I was present at a village meeting where every single person, including the serpent, was introduced in terms of how many died in their families. There was a discussion about a new site for the village, avoiding the earthquake line, including an issue as to the distance which bullocks could have to walk to reach the field and work. A person losing his wife, leaving back two small children, was offered by the father-in-law to marry his younger daughter, who would bring up the children with great affection. People's concept of normality referred to reconstruction of fallen temples and installing the deities and the restarting of marriage stations, marriage season. There were several spiritual discourses followed by Bhajan Peter. The finding was that the mental health problems were far less as per international standards due to cultural issues of rehabilitation. The mental health study at Bhopal Union Carbide disease disaster remained incomplete. Now the last example, we used to have a summer internship program at Pune for a month and a half through Pennsylvania University, whereby about 20 university students from Europe and America came to Pune every summer and opted for courses such as community development and health, performing arts with practicals in music, dance, etc and languages such as Sanskrit and Marathi. Every student was living with a family chosen to have a peer brother or sister. I was looking after the academic program. I asked the students to talk to foster mother, foster father, brother, sister, the maid coming to the house and somebody on the street outside house selling vegetables or even bananas on a land car, on a hand cart about their concept of health. The answers could be summarized as, as like this. Health meant for them good sleep, good bowel movement, good digestion, feeling hungry, feeling energetic, not getting tired easily, stamina to work, etc. None of them talked of illness and disease. Now let me conclude. Leonard Sign, a social epidemiologist, in foreword to the book by his anthropology student, James Strasser, with the title Epidemiology and Culture, 2005 publication from Cambridge University Press. He says in his foreword, 20 years ago, his student Strasser disagreed with everything I said in the class. His argument was, we were not giving enough attention to concepts of culture. Further, he says, we epidemiologists have suffered embarrassing failures in our design and implementation of intervention programs. Mm -hmm. We identified the disease risk factors and told the, told the public about it, thinking they will rush and change their risk behavior. But people have lives to lead. He further said that he made, he, he designed superb intervention studies, but they failed to produce the intended result. Now I think as he said, Trossel has been right and I was wrong. I offer best wishes to Professor Doshi and to all of you for the seminar. Anthropology is a wonderful holistic discipline. Let us keep the whole of it with focus as today on health and well-being. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. We truly appreciate the insightful discourse. And thank you, sir, for your kind exhortations. Our respected chief guest, Sri K. Rajeshwara Rao, is the special secretary of Nidhi Ayo, Karma of India. And we have heard in the welcome address about his feats as academician and administrator. His distinguished achievements, particularly during his long administrative experience, serving in different ministries of Karma of India. We are so much honored, sir, to have you to grace this occasion as our chief guest. And now may I invite you, sir, to address the participants. Please, sir. 
thank you very much i hope i'm audible to all of you yes sir yeah uh, thanks uh, once again and uh, good morning and uh, my warm regards to uh, professor pc joshi vice chancellor and university of delhi who is the in fact uh, the chief guest of this uh, program because the entire seminar is being organized to honor his uh, great contribution to the field i am only a participant here but uh, when professor saraswati mentioned that uh, i should come as a chief guest maybe because of certain protocol issues but i said no but i am not uh, personally i don't treat myself as a chief guest here professor p c joshi it is my honor to participate uh, in this uh, uh, program and uh, it is a great uh, privilege for me to associate in this activity professor mp sachdeva professor p r mondal professor r k mutatka professor saraswati garu several senior professors a distinguished teachers faculty academicians researchers and i could see more than 100 participants in the webinar so my pranam to all of you guru devo bhava acharya devo bhava because you are the uh, people who build the society who guide the society who nurture the society and help every section of society and uh, my pranams to all of you uh friends uh, when professor saraswati garu uh, approached me so i was very hesitant because each one of you have done uh, several decades and years of contribution to the field and i am uh, not really having great knowledge or anything about the subject but as a person associated with sociology i thought that uh, uh, i should uh, participate and uh, join the program and my previous speakers mentioned that this uh, national seminar is very very contextual because entire world is affected by the pandemic and india every corner perhaps is affected and there is a great learning uh, uh, on every day basis uh, to tackle this uh, disease and also to manage this uh, disease and uh, to help the society so that every stakeholder with uh, the relevant knowledge the be it clinicians be it anthropologists are the researchers everybody has a, a role to contribute and role to play and i am sure that this two day national seminar with the various relevant topics for us will be helpful to take it forward to various levels so that every stakeholder perhaps can be sensitized can benefit from this rich knowledge and also the experiences when i heard uh, professor p c joshi saab ka uh, association with medical anthropology for more than uh, four decades and his uh, uh, particular insights on the people's perspectives on conceptions of health and illness uh, across the northern india and his wide range of themes particularly in uh, social anthropology traditional medicine lifestyle diseases antibiotic resistance but i am sure that uh, this type of national seminars will give a, a wider dissemination of uh, these ideas and also all the veterans who are participating here can benefit the both rural urban and uh, tribal uh, segments of the society in not only uh, uh, facing this pandemic but also many other issues uh, friends uh, health well being and wellness these are all the three interconnected perspectives used to express the interconnectedness between various aspects of human existence and the interaction between the internal and external environments of the human existence and application of health anthropology with a bio socio cultural approach to health policies could greatly help in strengthening the public health strategies covid 19 pandemic has yet again made us realize the importance of public health and its strong linkages with people's behavior cultural and social settings it is significantly important that along with multiple medical science factors anthropology of health is kept as a key part in health research to provide conceptual and theoretical evidence as well as basis for relevant public health actions with its qualitative approach to data collection integrated and holistic view point anthropology makes noteworthy contribution to the development of public health policies the need of the hour is to achieve the mandates to make india a self reliant nation atmanirbhar bharat i am sure that this national webinar and the range of topics that are going to be discussed in these two days would certainly 
bring forward fresh ideas that will benefit all the stakeholders working in the field of uh, public health friends one important issue when uh, we talk about the uh, anthropology is there is a i think little bit bias towards uh, uh, tribal and uh, rural communities right from the beginning is a action anthropology and also a lot of research but urban areas uh, of late though uh, the pandemic perhaps the 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 most thrust is in the urban areas but urban areas normally particularly urban health gets neglected so my request to all the participants and other colleagues here is that we need to appropriately uh, adequately perhaps focus on the urban health also and keep the municipal elected and uh, officials and also the non officials as a stakeholders as a so that they can be sensitized to benefit from the anthropology because i have been handling urban for several years this is one gap i could uh, notice that there is a not much interaction not much uh, sharing and uh, benefiting from the knowledge of the anthropologists and urban health cannot be neglected because 31% uh, though the census says that uh, they are in the urban uh, area but uh, in fact there is an assessment is there that already with peri urban areas and also extended urban areas more than 40% of the india's population is in urban agglomerations so perhaps so uh, uh, we all perhaps can uh, rethink and redesign our priorities so that urban health also adequately benefited particularly by 2030 about uh, 60 crore population are expected to be in urban areas so perhaps uh, the entire segment and sector needs to benefit from your experience and your uh, perspectives because uh, uh, there is a uh, lot of uh, need for perhaps more and more interaction that was one of the reasons for me uh, to participate uh, in this seminar also but i am sure that uh, you are spread across the india in various zones and sectors in fact you can proactively take the leadership and contact the relevant uh, policy makers uh, district administration and also the municipal stakeholders uh, to benefits from some of the researches from some of the traditional medicine and uh, professor uh, mutadkar was giving various examples of chennai and other areas where the it can be a neem leaf or it can be a, a medicinal and herbs which we can use uh, in a very very effective ways and it is becoming very popular cut is the ministry of ayush also uh, there is a greater awareness uh, now perhaps in india compared to the earlier years so it is my honor sir professor joshi sir to be here to participate and uh, i am happy to perhaps interact with you further and all those institutions who have benefited from you and uh, you, all the fields which have been working i am sure that you will work for maybe uh, 20 25 years more though you will be demitting uh, formally because of the age issues but academicians uh, can work till the last day uh, which they are active and physically and uh, mentally and uh, anitya you will be very happy to associate with uh, each one of you in strengthening our uh, health management and also improving the uh, challenges which we face in the health crisis anyway i would not like to take more time because more and more interesting things uh, would be there for discussion and i uh, thank once again uh, uh, all the organizers and the participants for giving me this opportunity i treat this as my uh, play, personal uh, privilege and personal honor thank you very much namaskar thank you thank you sir for sharing us sharing with us your vast knowledge and experiences and thank you for encouraging us to step up as an anthropologist your words of wisdom has been very ventilating to our minds thank you sir now i invite professor kan saraswati the organizing secretary of this conference to give her remarks and also to reveal a surprise
I think there is a little technical problem, but uh, let us wait. So there's a slight, uh, slight technical error. I mean, uh, uh, there was a power cut. So just one minute, sir. Yes, yes, ma'am. Sorry for the. Uh, we are clear from here. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Ken Saraswati, the organizing secretary of the conference to give our remarks and also to reveal to us a surprise that she was planning. A very good morning to all of you. Joshi sir, the chief guest, uh, Dr. Rajesh Aragaru and uh, Dharmutat Kar sir. Uh, our head of the department, uh, Professor Sajideva, and all the other colleagues who are sitting here and who are present online, and all the senior professors uh, who have just joined uh, just on one phone call. When I requested them on one phone call, they all are here. So like uh, um, so Balram Pani sir is there, Papa Rao sir is there, Marwa sir, there are many more. So it will take time. I'm not taking everybody's name here. Uh, but one thing I can uh, say is like uh, today, whatever I'm going to say, I think it is supposed to be a surprise to most of us. And uh, especially to Joshi, sir, I think it should be a surprise. If we had listened to Mutatkar, sir, half the surprise is over. But still, I think... Uh, uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you some a little sur surprise. I think so, it is a surprise. I mean, uh, around through three months back or so, when we were planning for uh, some uh, farewell for uh, uh, Joshi, sir, we all sat in the lawn and we were thinking that we should have a grand, you know, uh, an exciting seminar for two days and all that. And everybody was uh, happy and we all agreed upon that. But somehow when I was sitting in my room and thinking, uh, just a seminar and a farewell is not enough for Joshi, sir. I think he deserves more than that, but he didn't know what to do. We wanted to do something big, 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 but we don't know what to do. So one day, uh, Dr. Mahajan walks into my room and he says, uh, ma'am, can't we take out a face shift, a book in his honor? That's a good idea, but you know, I don't know how to go about it. And there is a two, two and a half months left. The time is shoot too short. So, and that unfortunately, the day head of the department was out of station. And at that point of time in the department, because of, you know, lockdown and everything, only uh, Dr. Mitra and uh, uh, Professor Mandel were present. So four of us met in my in our room, in my room, and we decided to have, bring out a face shift. And uh, next day itself, we talked to our head of the department after he returned from his, uh, uh, I mean, some place. And then uh, we had an informal staff council meeting and we all have decided to go about it. But again, we have see, we saw, uh, sat down and uh, listed out the contributors. And here the contributors are mostly his former students, all our faculty members, almost all our faculty members. And some of his well-wishers and friends, senior persons who could, I mean, you know, complete the work in just one and a half months. We didn't have much time. And we got hold of a publisher. Publisher was also in stunned to say, how can you get a book within one and a half or two months? It's too short a time. But when I said it is for Joshi, sir, he said, well, I'll do it. Just uh, search names could be sold there. And finally, publisher said, I'll be doing it. And he started working on it. And you don't believe the last, the last lot of papers or last lot of you know uh, other modalities have been sent to him on twenty third. But still, that person finally could get uh, get us a book. And you know, yesterday evening at about eight o'clock or so, he he delivered only one copy. He said, "Madam, just for you all, we opened our workshop in lockdown, and finally we are doing it." 
he will be able to do. I said, why don't you give us four copies? He said, no, only one copy is possible. And he finally, at eight o'clock, he sent on a bike. Some person came and delivered it by residence. So thanks to that person, I mean, it was it was really surprising for a for a non academician to really work on a book and you know to make it successful. And finally, we came up with the book. And uh, sir, I tell you, <clears throat> whoever I talked. Once I take Joshi sir's name, there was absolutely no no from anybody. Everybody agreed, everybody cooperated. And here I would like to mention two of his former students, uh, Dr. Meer, Urfat Meer and Dr. Prashant Khatri. These two were the first, first person, the persons whom I contacted first. And, you know, they unconditionally at any point of time, they reviewed papers, two, three papers they sent and they coordinated amongst their own colleagues. And finally, they saw to it. Those were the first lot of papers that we received uh, for this book. And they really cooperated so well. I should be really thankful to those two people. So the book is ready with us, sir. And actually, we wanted it to be this, this whole function, farewell very exciting, very big, very special, very unique, but again, lockdown. So we were all stressed last one month, whether we will be able to do it or not, whether it is dual, whether it is physical, whether it is completely online. But somehow I was always feeling at least it should be dual board. And finally, we could be successfully doing it in a dual mode. I'm happy about it. And uh, the, so I now uh, request Joshi sir, Sachideva sir, and convener of the seminar, Professor Mondal, to be coming on to the, I don't think they'll be able to see, right? Huh. If they can come to the stage, we can uh, release the book. This is really good. <laughs> On to Professor More. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, man. Professor B.C. Joshi, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of University of Delhi, joined the Department of Anthropology in 2003 as a professor. He is one of the finest medical anthropologists in South Asia, and he was also the first anthropologist to become the Pro Vice Chancellor of University of Delhi, and now he is the Vice Chancellor. Besides his excellence in teaching and research, and his enormous publication in journals of high repute. 
he has an unequal distinction of being an able leader and a prudent administrator. He brought the much needed reform to the university and to the department in particular, showering smiles on everyone's face and restoring back the dignity that was due to everyone. His professional memberships are manifold. His organizational leadership is outstanding and his accolades and certificates of honor have come not only from medical anthropology, but also from different allied professional bodies like sociology, psychiatry, humanities, and other social sciences. And more than anything else, he is so deeply respected and so dearly loved by his colleagues. The Department of Anthropology, University of Delhi, is very fortunate to have such an iconic figure, Professor B.C. Joshi. Now, may I have the honor to invite you, sir, for speech. Good morning to all respected scholars. I think one of the advantages of online mode is that you can have more people, you know. I think I'm one of the very lucky persons to have a galaxy of anthropologists. I can see some of them. Professor R.K. Mutatkar, my guru, Professor Paparao, I can see. There are so, so many vice chancellors are there. And of course, we have top bureaucrats of our country, like uh, K. Rajeshwara Raoji, who gave a very, a very interesting speech today. I think I am really overwhelmed not because uh, that this is happening in my honor on a topic that is so Okay, I think now I, I should be audible. So the topic is so dear to me and I have been having a lifetime of working in the field of health and well-being. In fact, I think I have something to say here. But before I, I say about, I talk about well-being and health, I think there is something going on right now some kind of a churning is going on in our country right now. And I think I'll start from that. There is this uh, tussle that is going on between different pathies, allopathy versus Ayurveda versus this versus that. And there is a there is an attempt to sometimes it appears as if there is a clash, not clash of civil, civilizations, but at least clash of pathies that is going on. And I hear, you know, and I, I, I think if, if somebody from allopathy says allopathy is best and, uh, and if somebody from Ayurveda says Ayurveda is best or somebody from homeopathy says homeopathy is best or somebody from uh, naturopathy says naturopathy is best, I have no issue with that. They are. But there is some kind of a ethnocentrism there. I see some kind of an ethnocentrism which is so uh, well known to anthropology, which is there. And we need somebody now. I think that need of a person has really now come. Somebody who is equidistant with all of them. In, in other words, there is somebody who has some kind of a, not cultural relativism, but pathy relativ relativism, you know, this, if I may use this word, relativism uh, with respect to the different pathies. 
and who can be the best person to have that relativism to different pathies who is the person who can have equidistance at the, the same time would be knowing about the strengths and weaknesses of a pathy i think anthropologists are in a best are the best suited people who can have that kind of a pathy relativism because ultimately what do people need people need that their problems are solved that their health related problems are taken care of they are not interested in going to x y or z we have seen that the study of health seeking behavior that has been done by anthropologists and also others have been doing health seeking behavior why do people go to different different pathies they sometimes go to their temple sometimes they may go to dargah sometimes they may go to all india institute of medical sciences sometimes they may go to patanjali yoga everywhere people are going why people are going because they are in search of some relief people are interested in getting relief and i tell you the field of medicine is such which is in in truly secular secular in the sense that we forget that we are bound to a particular caste creed race religion you must have seen hindus flocking to dargahs to peers muslims going to hindu temples this is quite common in the field in the field of medicine particularly because people are concerned with relief now who can make sure who can be objective who can be i would say totally you know unattached because the moment you attach to a particular so therefore what i'm trying to say is that all pathies have evolved out of generations of experience and experimentations both experience and experimentation both have been done and they have also come out with very very important conclusions and now there is somebody who should be in a position to have that kind of a pathy relativistic position and able to guide people well if you have this this is the best place for you if you have this this is the best place i think people need that also very much because by going to wrong people are also wasting a lot of money so ayurveda is a great science this science has evolved from this land this science has evolved from here for the last have been working on how to provide you know relief to people for their troubles so there are a lot of insight that ayurveda has generated and lot of people thousands and thousands of people have worked in the field of allopathy and they have come out with great conclusions which are so beneficial to us same is true i would say even a a faith healer working in a village has also some positive elements but what happens that people sometimes choose a wrong pathy and because of choosing a wrong pathy lot of you know problems that happen to people lot of money that is wasted to people i know if you go to a tertiary care center hospitals people will say that people are not coming in the initial stages they are coming when they their, their case is hopeless i think this is also true that sometimes we are going to tertiary hospitals when the case has become hopeless because we were not guided we are not been able to guide at the right moment of time where should we be going and that is also creating so i think time has come for there is a fertile ground now for anthropologists especially medical anthropologists that they should be thinking about what i would like to call as anthropological medicines anthropological medicine is that anthropologically directed medicines anthropologically informed medicines so therefore i give you my own example you know i was suffering with allergy and a lot of skin problems that were happening because of allergy now that allergy 
जी आई वेंट टू ऑल काइंड ऑफ स्किन स्पेशलिस्ट बिकॉज आई बेसिकली रिलाई मोर ऑन एलोपैथिक सिस्टम मेडिसिन आई वेंट टू दिस एलोपैथी बट इन एलोपैथी I found that I've gone to all kinds of skin specialists. They can give you momentary relief, but beyond that, I was not getting. Then somebody told me that I should try Ayurveda. I tried Ayurveda, and Ayurveda was very good. So what I'm trying to say is that in 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 problems like allergies, one can try Ayurveda. In problems like arthritis, one can try Ayurveda. In especially in chronic chronic problems, Ayurveda has some benefits for us. but again for certain other things i think there is no alternative to allopathy there is no alternative to biologically based system of medicine because that system of medicine is what we call as evidence based evidence based medicine system is very very important and i think we should not be fighting about what is better than other nothing is better than all of all are best in their own right all systems of medicine are best in their own right and i think that is something we must understand now i'm very glad that we are talking about uh, about health and wellness today now health is something which i think has been uh, very intensely debated in the field of anthropology because health is not mere absence of disease you know like this i think long back way back in 1937 and if i if i may if i may say that exactly uh, there was this you know there was a british uh, document called political and economic planning in 1937 where they said health must come first the mere state of not being ill must be recognized as an unacceptable substitute too often tolerated or even regarded as normal so people started questioning that health is much more much larger a kind of uh, uh, entity than absence of disease and of course when we came with who famous who definitions where i think for the first time they had used both the terms health as well as well being and they talked about health and talked about that health is not merely physical or not in absence of disease but but much much more than in fact wellness well being is also a very very complicated very very complex uh, uh concept you know at least there are three dimensions of well being that that we are aware of that people have been discussing the psychological well being the economic well being and health related well being so these are all three different uh, well beings in fact you know like uh, even a thing like you know well being includes happiness satisfaction mental health quality of life social capital human functioning so many things are there which are part of the well being which are there even you know one of that uh, one of that element of well being happiness that i talked to you about is not mere change in the feeling you know you have this uh, bhutan you have gross national happiness index bhutan is known for it and happiness is not mere laughing about or you know like feeling very good feeling pleasant no there are nine domains of happiness that in bhutan they so this is also a very complex and a very multi uh, faceted idea or a phenomenon we have psychological well being nine domain that uh, bhutan recognizes psychological well being health education time use culture governance community vitality environmental diversity living standards these are the nine different uh, domains across which they define national gross national happiness or happiness to people so this is therefore what i'm trying to say like health is not mere absence of disease wellness or even happiness is a very very complex now in india you know like when we talk of health generally we not only restrict ourselves to the whereabouts of a person we use the term hal chal chal is also there chal you know is very important i think that has to be understood so chal means we are talking about uh, you know movements as well as so health is also defined in terms of movement but i'll like to take you briefly to john sar bauer among the khasas of uh, central himalayas where i work where health is you know like there is a hierarchy across which the health is identified health is defined 
health is understood, health is debated. Now, first level is what is called as, if I may translate it, that individual level of health, which is called as pain and tiredness. Now, these two things are very important. They are pain, like Al Chal, we say, they say Pida Khoda. Pida Khoda means pain and tiredness. So, individual level, at the level of individual, we have pain and tiredness. Are you having pain or tiredness or you are really, you are, get, you are, you know, beyond pain and tiredness. That is the kind of an individual level that they define health as. Then we have second level is Gharbar. Gharbar is another. That is at the level of family. So they are looking at the family as another level where things are okay or things are not okay. The third level is Kutum Parivar. Kutnu Parivar is a slightly higher, that is more like consanguinous, more like your, your blood relatives, within your blood relatives, like the village and all, are you okay or not? The, the next level is Soga Santri, that is your relatives, that is people who are related to you by virtue of marriage. So this is, these are different levels at which we will try to look at the health of a person. Then we have Khet Kalyan, that is at the level of, you know, uh, at the level of your fields, your, uh, you know, your uh, harvest and all those things, whether there are disasters or, you know, floods and all those things, destroying it. And finally, you have chonchares, that is your animal wealth. So, so this is the health of a person. If you are looking at health of a person, is, is much more than absence of disease, even in a, in a, in a context of a tribal, uh, tribal society like the Khasas. So you have got all, and this is health is when everything or most of the things at this level are, are okay. And therefore, health is, is never, from the very beginning, we have been saying that health is not a static concept. It's more of a dynamic, it's a dynamic concept. And dynamic, multifaceted dynamic, dynamism is there in the health. So I think I'm very glad that uh, Dr. Saraswati and Dr. Sajdeva, particularly, they have thought about the fresh rip. I think, I must tell you, for the last one year, one of my own book is lying with the same publishers and I'm, I have not been able to get it through because of the COVID, but I don't know what magic you people have done. And my book is already, you know, like second, it's second uh, proof reading has already, already been done, but then still it is lying there. But uh, I'm really glad to know, it is really a surprise to me that uh, you have all taken pains and uh, you have all tried to do that. I think... Finally, before I, 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 I leave, you know, I would like to again. Vinay Kumar Srivastava, whom we lost, you know. And I think, as you say, this program is very fun. It is, I don't know what you say in this English, it is a very fun program. If it is a fun program, it is a good program. So, it would have been really a great, uh, great thing. I would have really loved to have him. In fact, uh, uh, his, uh, our, uh, you know, Mrs. Kumkum Srivastava recently told me that I have written a very good obituary of uh, Vinay Srivastava. I said I never thought and never wished that I should be writing his obituary. But then this is the cruel hand of destiny that snatched him away from us. And I would have been really enjoyed and really liked my any activity of my farewell in his presence but then i think he's present somewhere so and his his blessings and his good wishes are there so with these words i am really overwhelmed i am really thankful to all of you i am really thankful to the department of anthropology to which i am really indebted that uh, i have no hesitation in saying that whatever i am today is all because of the Department of Anthropology. This is a small place, you know, it's not a, uh, I don't think it is, the place is more than one acre here, but then this uh, less than one acre space has given me so much, uh, given me, you know, so beautiful students, given me such uh, wonderful colleagues and friends, friends and also well-wishers like Professor R.K. Mutatkar, Professor R.B. Singh, and, you know, so many, Professor Basa and uh, Professor Mondal, Professor Papara. I'm really overwhelmed. I'm really thankful to all of you. So with these words, I would like to say goodbye. Namaskar. Thank you so much, sir, for the inaugural speech. That is very apt 
for the seminar to begin. And it has really energized us to go further in our pursuit for anthropology of health and also to contribute towards anthropologically informed medicines. We have just one word to say, that is thank you so much. We really love you and we honor you for this. Thank you, sir. And now, may I invite Dr. Chakradeva Mahajan to offer the word of thanks. Um, huh? Okay. So, um, okay. So, uh, very good morning to all of you. And uh, I've been interested with this very pleasant duty of saying thanks. Uh, I've been uh, given this very pleasant duty of uh, thanking you all. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to um, give my special uh, thanks to today's uh, chief guest, uh, Shri K. Rajeshwar Rao and Professor R. K. Mutatkar, guest of honor. Our uh, head of the department has uh, facilitated this uh, book as well as the seminar. He's, um, he's supported us in every way possible. No event can be successful without people who dedicate their resources and time to make sure everything is faultless. My colleagues, Professor Kian Saraswati, Professor R.P. Mitra, and Professor P.R. Mondal, they've been backbones to this whole idea of the Fresh Shift volume and the seminar today. All my colleagues in the department, whether uh, these were senior colleagues or colleagues who have just joined, they participated in the whole exercise wholeheartedly. I thank them all. Professor Manoj Kumar Singh, Professor Banmirthang Mure, Dr. Avitoli Zimo, Dr. Vipin Gupta, Dr. Mitashri Srivastav, Dr. Shivani Chandel, Dr. Kennedy Singh, Dr. Kiran Mala Devi, and Dr. Suniti Yadav. Dr. Suniti Yadav also prepared the program schedule and invitation and uh, other, other material related to the uh, seminar. Our heartfelt thanks goes to the senior professors who have contributed to this project on a very, very short notice. Two of my teachers, Professor A.K. Sinna, Professor Abhi Khosh from Punjab University, and we had papers from all over India. So Professor Shugore from Calcutta University, Professor Sumati from Madras University, Professor Rumi Dev from MIT University, Professor Sunita Reddy from Jawaharlal Nehru University, and a wonderful, wonderful students uh, team of Professor uh, Joshi, uh, Dr. Urfa Tanjim Mir and uh, Dr. Hemlata from Ambedkar University, Delhi, Dr. Sonia Kaushal, and Dr. Vijay Sundri Devi from Sagar University, Dr. Prashant Khatri from Allahabad University, and Dr. Kalindi from MIT. We had contributions also from uh, Dr. Venkatramna, who's at Indira Gandhi National Open University. And uh, there were postdoctoral scholars, uh, Dr. Minakshi, uh, she readily prepared a manuscript for us. All the manuscripts were reviewed and these manuscripts were, re were reviewed by the contributors themselves. But there were, there were people, uh, there were colleagues uh, who could not contribute but have 
given their energy and effort by reviewing the manuscripts. Dr. Gagandeep Kaur, Dr. Priyanka Rani Garg, along with all the names which I've already mentioned, they reviewed manuscripts for us. I thank them all. Dr. Um, Ms. Seema Sirpal of Delhi University Computer Center was very helpful. She helped us with the software, which is uh, to detect plagiarism. She also helped us with other technical things. We are also thankful to, in the morning, you must have seen this hall looking really, really uh, good. Uh, and beautiful, and that was because of the Garden Committee of Delhi University. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dabas, uh, who personally came uh, to supervise the uh, whole uh, uh, decoration thing. And my special thanks goes to Imna and Vineet, who were with us throughout this journey, three months, all the correspondence, all the manuscript checking, all the editorial and proofreading work was done by these two scholars who are working with Professor Kian Saraswati. I thank them on my own behalf and on the behalf of the organizing committee of the seminar, as well as the department. They've been real assets for the department. Most of all, I would like to thank Mr. Ashok Mittal. He is our savior. He is someone who made this day possible. And uh, it was only because of uh, Professor Joshi that I could meet Mr. Mittal. It was a chance meeting, which was uh, the book uh, which Professor Joshi is mentioning now that is lying with him for last two years now. Uh, I went to give him all the material and that is when I told him that this is what we are planning. And he said, I can, I'll do anything with, for Professor Joshi. So uh, our thanks to the concept publishers who, who made it possible. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. If I'm forgetting, please forgive me. And I think it would be, um, it, I, I won't be fulfilling my duty if I don't thank Professor Joshi, because he's the spirit, he's the backbone of both this seminar and the Fair Shift volume. Anyone, as uh, Professor, jo, uh, Professor Saraswati has already talked about it, Professor Saraswati was telling us uh, that, you know, anybody we approached, any person for, for contribution, for review, for any technical help, we were, they were there. And their love for Professor Joshi is immense. And we thank them all. Our, our non-teaching staff has, has come in this, uh, you know, these are difficult times and they've been supporting us. Manwar Singh, Anand Singh, Pramod. So th these are the people who've been coming to the department. I cannot forget Sunanda. She is someone who decorated this hall and she's been a uh, very big support. You must might have seen her on screen also helping us with the giving of gifts. So I, I also would like to thank you all uh, because this event has become very special because you are the witness. And uh, I, I thank you all from the core of my heart. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Marjan. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Now over to the host. Dr. Mure, hello, Dr. Yes. Mure, yes, ma'am. Uh, Sachdeva sir is saying uh, there are many comments in the chat box. If you can okay. just, uh, uh, you know, like, yes. uh, speak. Uh, 
maybe we'll go uh, through them fast. We'll uh, we'll do that honor. Pardon, Doctor Avidoli. Oh, yes, okay. sir. Yes, sir. I'm here. I'm here. I'll do that. Okay. Now we go so, over to the host here. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, After so, this, we can break. Exactly at 11.20 or 15, we can start the first session. Yeah. All right. So I, I will just read out some very good messages coming in this morning. Well, um, we have... Uh... Okay, by the way, I want to remind all of you that our sessions are being live streamed in the YouTube channel. It is called Visual Anthropology DU, so you can share the link as well. Um, we have uh, Professor Anima Sharma who... Uh, who has written that it is privileged to get an opportunity to attend this grand occasion. Then there's Professor K.K. Bassa. He said, I congratulate Department of Anthropology, Delhi University, for organizing this seminar as a mark of tribute to Professor P.C. Joshi on his superannuation. My best wishes to Professor Joshi for his illustrious academic career. Regards. That is Professor uh, Kishore Kumar Bassa. Well, uh, from Professor Arun Kumar, uh, he said, Good morning, everyone gathered in this seminar. My hearty congratulations to DU Anthropology Department for organizing this program on the occasion of superannuation of Professor P.C. Joshi. Then we have uh, Professor Sunita Reddy from JNU. Um, it's indeed a pleasure to participate and present a paper paper in, in honor of Professor P.C. Joshi to mark his superannuation. I congratulate the Department of Anthropology and my best wishes to Joshi, sir. Then we have from Professor Suman Kundu, a very good morning to you all. Wish the anthropology community a successful and fruitful deliberation over two days in the National Seminar on Anthropology of Health and Wellbeing. Accolades and appreciation for the Department of Anthropology for organizing the webinar on a topic very relevant in the current times to honor the significant academic contribution to Professor P.C. Joshi. Uh, this very, uh, very beautiful message is from Professor Suman Kundu. Uh, we have um, Professor R.B. Singh, a former professor, Department of uh, Geography in Delhi University, an advisor to Center for Himalayan Studies. He wrote, thanks to Department of Anthropology uh, for, uh, for the invitation and for, uh, and for organizing this seminar in honor of, uh, in honor of our own honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor P.C. Joshiji. Con Contributions of Professor Joshi are well received by the academic and policymaking communities, wishing him best possible success in his academic, administrative, and personal fronts in long time to come. That is Professor R.B. Singh. Uh, we also have uh, um, certain appreciation. Okay, this is Dr. Prashant Khatri. He is one of the former students of Professor Joshi, and actually he. He's thanking Professor Saraswati for the acknowledgement, and also he said that it was an honor to work for this book. Um, uh, th there are some congratulatory messages for Professor Saraswati for all the efforts and for all these wonderful acts. Um, and there are many congratulations from our participants like Divish who has uh, congratulated for the newly published book. Uh, we have Professor Sumathi from Madras University congratulating uh, you know expressing congratulations for the newly published book many many congratulations from somebody who is known as galaxy i wish he or she rename and use his uh, official name so that we can acknowledge the message that have been written by you we have a beautiful message from dr indu talwar she wrote heartiest congratulations to all the organizers of this seminar for this wonderful gesture in honor of professor joshi who truly deserves it such a beautiful message ma'am thank you then there is um, a message from Dr. Lalit Kumar. Um, he said, congrats and thanks to Professor Saraswati Ji for thinking and for doing something big for Professor P.C. Joshi. And, um, you know, you have done it. So I think that's a, ve that's a very uh, good congratulatory message. Um, uh, so, sir, like, you know, mostly the, the messages are about congratulations to Professor Joshi, congratulations to the team for organizing this uh, seminar and for the published book that was, you know, it was so difficult to keep it as a secret for one month, more than one month, but it's out and uh, cannot be, you know, more prouder than uh, our department, our colleagues who have done all this so far. So, these have come in the morning. So, thanks, sir. Over to you. Oh, per, now it's 11.17, so maybe the moderator of the first session, Dr. Vibin Kupta, should may, may take over. Dr. Vibin Kupta?
प्रोफेसर मालवा सर गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग पप्पा राव सर डॉक्टर सुनीता गुड मॉर्निंग सुनीत यादव गुड मॉर्निंग सर सर गुड मॉर्निंग हाउ आर यू सर फाइन फाइन पप्पा राव सर गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग सिन्हा जी कैसे हैं सर आप अच्छा हो अच्छा वाह इन बेंगलोर मैं मैं बेंगलोर में है गुड मॉर्निंग सर सेशन सर Yes, madam. Madam. Good morning and congratulations, madam. Congratulations, डॉक्टर विपिन यू आर म्यूटेड नाउ एम आई ऑडिबल नाउ यस परफेक्टली ओके सो द फर्स्ट सेशन इज ऑन इंडिजिनस एंड ट्राइबल हेल्थ रिसर्च एंड टू चेयर दिस सेशन वी हैव वेरी एमिनेंट प्रोफेसर ए के सिन्हा हु इज अ सोशल एंथ्रोपोलॉजिस्ट फॉर पंजाब यूनिवर्सिटी चंडीगढ़ and he has expertise in social anthropology and known for his wide uh, area of research and interest like theories of anthropology uh, medical anthropology uh, diabetes public health uh, and other um, health related disorders he has contributed immensely in developing social anthropology in india and to assist him we have a co-chair a very dynamic personality uh, dr prashant khatri from university of uh, alabad and he's a young force and a rising face of anthrop social anthropology in india who is working in medical anthropology practical applicability of gandhian thoughts uh, livelihoods uh, uh, disaster and other issues so i welcome both of you again and request you to start the session thank you thank you so much dr vipin for this introduction <coughs> uh, good morning professor sinha sir sir mute you are mute sir okay good morning good morning sir good to see you after a very long time yes after allahabad after allahabad yes that's right seminar right so how are you uh, sir i am fine sir i am absolutely fine uh, so uh, sir we have uh, six papers in this session sir yeah and uh, uh, if you say i can uh, name them and then we can just start the session no name so, we know just we start due to possibility okay. of time should start okay sure so no right uh, professor rp mitra okay so and time should uh, be I, around 20 minutes okay sir and all presenters are requested to kindly finish within time period okay so uh, with the permission of the chair i will like to invite professor rp mitra sir who is going to speak on the topic celebrating the contributions of professor pc joshi to medical anthropology over to you sir mitra sir good afternoon uh, good afternoon to all good morning hai sir mitra sir it is good morning Mitra sir, you are not audible. Uh, Mitra, Dr. Mitra, I'm sorry. Inadvertently, uh, it was muted. So could you please unmute yourself? Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, yeah. Am I audible now? 
Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Audible, but the video is off, sir. Yeah. Am I visible now also along with being audible? Yes, sir. Perfect. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, my uh, uh, thanks to uh, Professor Sinha, uh, Dr. Khatri, Professor uh, Joshi, uh, Professor Deva, all dignitaries who are joining us online, senior professors, colleagues, dear friends. Uh, I'll be talking about today the contribution which uh, Professor Joshi has made to the study of medical anthropology. You know what happens sometime in academics, certain disciplines. It, in, in certain disciplines, in certain uh, sometimes in academics, what happens, certain disciplines get identified with person. Uh, they chisel the discipline on the anvil of their contribution, zeal, and enthusiasm. The same can be said of Professor Joshi. Professor Joshi and medical anthropology, they are synonymous with one another. He has created a brand, what Erickson has referred to as engaged and collaborative medical anthropology that has expanded the traditional boundaries of the discipline. Raymond Firth, uh, the famous economic anthropology once said, that when you are talking about interdisciplinary fields like medical anthropology, economic anthropology, or political anthropology, which are at the conjunction of two or more disciplines, people there suffer from what he called fear nervosa. This was not so in the case of medical anthropology, which Professor Joshi practiced. He truly established a cross-disciplinary medical anthropology, which has flourished in partnership with medicine, psychiatry, psychology, rather than experiencing the fear nervosa, which has characterized the disciplines which are at the conjunction cross borders of the discipline. We often make a distinction between anthropology of medicine and anthropology in medicine. When we talk about anthropology, in medicine, we are talking about an applied discipline, a problem shooter that solves problems relating to health and illness, which medical science sometimes may fail to handle. In Professor Joshi's practice of medical anthropology, what we find is coming together of this anthropology of practice and anthropology in practice to establish truly a biocultural discipline as an institutional builder, as a, as a person who initiated and nurtured the teaching of medical anthropology in many institutions, the contribution of Professor P.C. Joshi is unparalleled in the development of medical anthropology in India. I will take up a framework for today's paper from a work which was done by Giyot Dineva and Maya Unnitharan Kumar in their book titled as Critical Journeys, Making of an Anthropologist, they pointed out the important role which academic institution plays in shaping the academic journey of anthropologists. In the academic career of Professor Joshi spanning nearly four decades, he was associated with three important institutions. And when I, or when we looked at his work, we see the critical influence which all these three institutions played in his medical anthropology. We can clearly discern four distinct orientations in the practice of medical anthropology by Professor Joshi. They are, first, what we see is a systemic cognitive approach where the focus is on medical systems as social systems. Thereafter, we see medical anthropology as a collaborative biocultural 
discipline. The third trend which we see in the work of Joshi sir is medical anthropology as an engaged discipline, where we see three kinds of important contribution which Joshi sir has done to disaster research, to study of societal behavior, and third, to the anthropology of policy perspective. And the fourth trend which we see is, is medical anthropology as a deliverable science. And finally, we see medical anthropology, the aesthetics of it in terms of visual anthropology in Sir's work. Now, I would be trying to look at these five trends through the career work which Joshi sir did in medical anthropology. It all started with his doctoral work on ethnomedical systems of John Sarris, which was the perhaps the first PhD done in medical anthropology in the department. Tobriander Island, what is what Malinowski was to the Tobriander Islands of Papua New Guinea, I say PC Joshi is to Khasas of John Sarbauer. He is the undisputed regional specialist of John Sarbauer. Every anthropologist who would come to this area would consult Joshi sir about the place. And he also very generously shared his time and his expertise about the area. This endeared him to anthropologists like William Sachs. And they profited immensely from his understanding and from his perspective of the place. Knowledge shared is knowledge gained. This has been the academic value which Joshi sir has, 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 has always cherished and practice throughout his career. Now let us start with the framework which I proposed earlier. And let me start with his work when he was at Garhwal University from where he started his career in 1985. His publication during this phase, the first phase of his career on medical anthropology, mostly touched upon traditional medical system health-seeking behavior in central Himalayan uh, societies and culture, and how they look at the concept of health illness. And one of the very fascinating article which he authored during this time was the pursuit of protein on man eating, on meat eating in Garhwal, which was published in Indian Anthropologist in 1994. The article is an interesting account of how food, social institution, health, and ecology are all linked together in a one chain. During this time, he also co-authored a book on medical anthropology with Anil Mahajan. And I would say this is a primer for one who is entering the field of medical anthropology. For the first time, we had a book from an Indian author who looked at the critical concepts of medical anthropology in the perspective of culture, in perspective of the society. It is very lucidly written. These same ideas were further explored in a, another article which he co-authored with Another legend of the department, Professor Vinay Srivastav, at a later time, titled as Dialogues and Interpretation of Illness, which was published in 1986, 1995, in the Eastern Anthropologies. They made use of the illness narrative framework and the explanatory model of Kleinman to understand how illness and disease model they can be collated together, brought together. The theme which Sir was focusing upon today to bring about succor, to bring about cure, to bring about effective healing for the people. Other than, uh, other than health, he also wrote articles 
about issues like afforestation in hill regions and how they are significant when we are talking about health, when we are talking about ecological stability, when we are talking about uh, well-being of a place. Now, I would draw your attention to one of the most fascinating article of this genre, which was written later in 19, 2000, titled as Relevance and Utility of Traditional Medical System in the Context of a Himalayan Tribe, which was published in the Sage Journal, Psychology and Developing Societies in 2002. Now, this article very interesting. The article is very interesting for four reasons. The first thing we see in this article is a shift, a shift of understanding the concept of health as a state to understanding of health and well-being as a socio-cultural process. Now, it is a reversing of the whole framework. Earlier, we were moving from health to society. Now, what Joshi sir did was he moved from social society and culture to health. Now, this this was a very important uh, understanding to redefine the concept of well-being. Secondly. He changed the entire paradigm of how we looked at suffering. Suffering always has been seen in the biomedicine framework as a, some kind of a malady. In this article, exploring the unique perspective of the khasas on which this article was based upon, Sir changed the understanding of illness from something which is a malady to functional, the functionality of the suffering. Now, what we say when we use, when he used the term functionality, by functionality, he writes that it is functionality because suffering resets the relationship of the individual with the ecology with the surrounding and this resetting of the relationship it changes the whole perspective of how we look at suffering not just merely as a problem but something which contains a hidden message which people read and which people try to understand when they are suffering. Now, second important part of this article is Joshi sir shifted. When he moved from functionality, he shifted the understanding of well-being from morbidity and mort mortality to the concept of what is called as how, how people looked at the concept of healing. And this healing how it is different from the remedial focus which we see in the context of Western medicine. The third important idea which Sir explored in this article was that when we talk about health, we have to talk of health not in a singular sense. We have to talk of health as a web of health. And how profound was Joshi Search in 2002 when he said in that article that there cannot be a health of an individual. There can only be a healthy individual in a healthy society and a healthy culture. So we have to look at health in terms of health of humans, health of animals, health of non-animate, health of supernatural. All of them come together. This is the theme which Sir further developed in a comment article which he wrote in Current Anthropology, where he said that the thing is that all systems are good, but all systems also have their 
shortcomings the shortcomings of the biomedicine is the remedial bias it governs biomedicine they miss out they miss out on what is called the art of living they miss out on what is called the art of suffering they miss out on what is called art of dying which are so significant in trying to create an harmony between an individual and its surrounding it is this harmony which was the focus of professor joshi's work in his understanding of well being in 1997 this is the second phase and where we see the beginning of collaborative anthropology in his approach towards medical anthropology he moved to delhi to head the department of medical science in the institute of human behavior and allied sciences now one can see during this phase a more clinical based and applied approach in his practice of medical anthropology now coming back to the framework which i developed initially about uh, how academic institutions play an important role uh, it has as an institution was a multi disciplinary institution where there were experts from psychology there were experts from uh, uh, psychiatry there were experts from other behavioral sciences now here sir has to prove its metal as a medical anthropologist because medical anthropology was not seen here just as a critical discipline here medical anthropology is seen as an applied discipline which would help these other specialists to solve the problems relating to health relating to health delivery relating to illness now during this period what we see is cutting edge research by joshi sir focusing on issues like mental health aging women's health psychosocial consequences of traumatic events and this was the phase where sir developed collaborative medical anthropology this collaborative med medical anthropology the best article which sir wrote was on how the traditional healers they can play an important role along with other medical specialists with respect to women's health and this article appeared in a very prestigious journal which is titled as uh, national medical journal of india in 2000 and uh, which was which was about targeted health care delivery systems and how medical anthropology can contribute towards it we also see during this time new topics of research which joshi sir took up and among them two are very significant one was on concept of aging and how medical anthropologists they have looked at this process of aging and 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 how how the problems of aging has to be understood the article appeared in the issue of seminar in the year uh, 2000 where he talked about that just a biomedical perspective towards elderly will not enable us to handle the problems of elderly he said factors like loneliness the solitary nature the depression the forlorn the desolateness they are closely linked to the social structure they are closely linked to the social change they are closely linked to the family structure so we need to understand them as not just a somatic issue but psycho social and cultural somatic issue further in this phase we see number of articles which are written on anthropology of trauma and how trauma needs to be understood 
medical anthropology and what medical anthropology can do in handling these applied problems of people where you need the direct action of medical anthropology. 2003 was the year when Sir came back to his alma mater, Department of Anthropology, University of Delhi. Here we see, this is the third phase, here we see the emergence of the master medical anthropologist who combined the critical approach to applied aspect to produce a uniquely blended, engaged medical anthropology. The best way to look at this engaged medical anthropology is through the number of international research projects which Joshi Sir took up, which Joshi Sir took up during this time. And I would like to mention here, among all the projects, the most important project has been the one which came from Microdis European Union about uh, the about the impact of uh, impact of uh, uh, impact of uh, these events, the extreme events, to help to to social and to the economic conditions of the people. Now, this project was important for two reasons. And of course, the third reason, there was a third reason, which was personal reason. Let me talk about the academic reasons. The first reason uh, in terms of academics was thus it led to the establishment of anthropology of disaster in the department. Secondly, academically, this was important because Professor Joshi, through the use of medical anthropology, change the whole understanding of these disasters from something happening arbitrarily, something which is not in a control to something where, where anthropologists can make a very important role in transforming the idea of hazard, haphazardness. So he redefined that they are not just haphazard events which leads to a lot of impact on the people. These have social and cultural underpinnings. And among the social and cultural underpinnings, the most important idea which Joshi Sir developed in his article on impact of uh, floods on the mental health of people is the one which he, uh, wherein he said that this whole idea of vulnerability, this whole idea of risk to the people, they have to be socially and culturally understood. Therefore, extreme events are not just ecological events. There are social, cultural, and political dimension. And as a medical anthropologist, one has to understand them when one, when one wants to get a holistic perspective. The phenomenological perspective towards disaster and pre and post phases as cultural processes are clearly demonstrated in his work on Bharaj, a district in Uttar Pradesh, which is prone to floods and the victims of super cyclone Alia in the Sundarvan village. He changed the whole understanding of disaster in context of anthropology. And the third, which is a personal reason is, whenever these project meetings were held, Sir used to give us lavish lunch in the guest house. We were, uh, we were, we enjoyed Sir's hospitality number of times and the good food because there were these European people coming. So very good food we enjoyed in the guest house of the University of Delhi. Uh, during this time, 
uh, his stay as the master social anthropologist, what we see is the fourth phase in his work. This was that medical anthropology has to become a deliverable science. As a deliverable science, it has not only to understand the problems relating to health, not only there has to be a criticality, not only there has to be an interpretive understanding, one has to move beyond that. There has to be no criticism without solution. This has been the idea through which he approached medical anthropology in the fourth phase of his career. And he took up, he took up some of the most important challenges which confronts our society. Issues like societal behavior, issues like women's health, issues like how best to integrate the traditional healing practices and to formulate not and to formulate a healthcare policy wherein uh, it can it can really solve the problem of people by 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 looking at them in an integrated manner Professor Mitra, sir, Professor Mitra, just, time. I'll, I'll just wind up. Give me one minute. I'm towards the end. And in this phase, what we saw is another interest of Professor Joshi. This was not in medical anthropology. This was in the history of medical anthropology and the history of social institutions. He wrote a number of articles related to how institutions come about what the role of individuals in creating the institution. Professor Joshi wrote many articles. He published more than nine books, authored, authored with other people. He has written in many international journals. The most important part of medical anthropology of Professor Joshi has been that we all published in anthropological journals Sir published in journals which are top journals in medical science, thereby bringing a credibility that medical anthropology is not a discipline which is restricted in terms of scope. He published articles about antibiotic use in collaborations with doctors. He had publication in major things. And finally, I would like to end here that one of his last article really holds what is wrong with many of the things in Indian anthropology. He held the pulse. He said, there are four things which we are missing. The first he said is LOC, lack of confidence in our ability. We need to be more confident. Second, he said ICS, inferiority complex of the scholars. We always are in awe of foreign publication. We never value our own scholarship. Third is the whole idea of datification. How we make something as sacred beyond criticism. He called it as MOS. And finally, this whole idea of you pat my back, I will pat yours mutual appreciating club. If we can overcome these four maladies, medical anthropology, anthropology in general will be a much vibrant discipline than it is today. Joshi sir, throughout his career has tried to do so. Let us follow in his footsteps and right to establish medical anthropology in the way sir has try to do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving me such a patient hearing. And I want to thank Joshi sir who is there in front of me listening to me. I'm very nervous talking about his work in front of me because he can help me anytime. So thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mitra sir for this very erudite presentation and you have really covered a lot of ground and I think one, just uh, 20 minutes are not enough to speak about scholar of his stature. Now, uh, I would like to uh, call upon Professor Abhay Ghosh, sir, 
who will be speaking on the dark side of indigenous medicines adverse effects and isms over to you sir thank you very much thank you for inviting me and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here first and foremost let me before i begin when we went for our masters field work to podi gadwal that was the first time i met professor p c joshi along with professor kalla and professor marwa professor joshi initially came to visit us and then we went over to visit his department at the time the hnb university department of anthropology where for the first time i had the opportunity to see closely some specimens collected from rupund that was my first interaction with him i was a researcher at the time doing my masters dissertation i was just a student of anthropology but he kept in touch all through and over these years by growing himself he has pushed me to contribute to various things where i have learned so much and which i don't think i would have learned if he had not been there to push me into it the second thing is that today i'm very happy that we've been able to be a small part in uh, the department's major effort to create a volume to be presented as a fresh shift for professor joshi because this was one of his uh, well qualities in his first seminar that he held in the department on tribal health and medicine he was able to do the same thing over a period of i think within two or three months he produced a book which was gifted to each and every person who came to the seminar and which constituted of the papers that were presented at the seminar so i am very happy that uh, this knowledge this enthusiasm that he created on the subject was i think uh, something that has become institutionalized okay so medical anthropology is something i learned not only from professor shrivastav but also by through the papers and the works and the discussions with professor joshi over the years and they have formed something of a baseline for whatever i have done over the years and so sir thank you for everything and we hope you will continue to contribute in many many ways over the years i now turn to my paper this is on the dark side of uh, indigenous medicines their adverse effects and isms the ism or indian systems of medicine industry and the attendant pharma companies are one of the really large businesses in the world uh as the recent assessment show according to the report ayurveda market in india 2021 to 2024 the indian market of this sector showed a value of 300 billion in indian rupees in 2018 and was expected to cross a value of 710.87 billion by 2024 
increasing at a compound annual rate of 16.06%. Now, according to this report, the key drivers of the growth of this market include maintenance of a healthy lifestyle, increase in the consumer's preference for food products like herbal tea, cornflakes, oats, cookies, biscuits, jams, spices, and almond oil made with uh, various kinds of natural ingredients, a shift of preference of consumers for herbal personal care products, with the increase in awareness of the harmful effects of chemicals on health used in the production of popular conventional skin, hair, body, and other beauty care products has become the driving force behind the growth of the market. So the traditional practices of herbal and Ayurvedic medicines or treatments has found global acceptance, thereby broadening the prospects of Ayurveda tourism in India. As a consequence of which, many Ayurveda rejuvenation and therapeutic centers have been established in states like Kerala, Uttarakhand, Goa, and Odisha, along with many other states. During the lockdown, I noticed that these spas and treatment centers were really advertising. Today, they are advertising company executives as well as any uh, well uh, person who is working from home to do the their office work in their own areas in congenial surroundings and while being treated this makes for a whole new arena of you know tourism while you work from home so there are also some problems that hamper this growth, this growth of Ayurvedic products. There is low yield of high quality herbal and medicinal plants in India and due to adverse weather conditions. Besides, the large scale use of insecticides and pesticides causes degradation of the quality of herbs with medicinal properties. And these two factors lead to shortage of high quality plants and lead to the deteriorating quality of these products and services. So quality certifications in India are carried out by several players. They include FPS, that is finished product specifications, good manufacturing practice, international, that is ISO, International Organization for Standardization, and so on. Often they do not adhere to the quality standards for the products and services offered. So regular tests to check whether manufacturing guidelines are met or are not carried out need to be done. The lack of proper scientific documentation of traditional Ayurvedic practices is also a major problem. Now, some estimates put the total number of formulations on the market relating to herbal medicines at about 1,289 botanicals from 2,400 plant species spread out over 960 plant taxa. On the 17th of March, 2020, the Rajya Sabha tabled two bills for consideration. The first was the National Commission for Indian System of Medicine Bill, 2019. And the second, the National Commission for Homeopathy Bill, 2019. The purpose of these bills was to repeal the Indian Medicine Central Council Act, 1970, and create a regulated medical education system to ensure the availability of quality medical professionals practicing the ISMs such as Ayurveda. This along with providing quality medical education for homeopathy and adopting of the latest medical research are the primary objectives of these bills. Some of the others are to include 
a periodic assessment of medical institutions and an effective grievance redressal mechanism. The Minister of State for Ayush, Mr. Shripad Yeso Nayak, introduced the Institute of Teaching and Research in Ayurveda Bill 2020 on February 10, 2020. And this bill seeks to merge the three Ayurveda institutions into one institution under the name of Institute of Teaching and Research in Ayurveda. So the National Commission for Indian System of Medicine Bill 2019 provides for the establishment of a constitution of the National Commission for Indian Systems of Medicine, NCISM. It is to consist of 29 members appointed uh, by the central government. The NCISM will serve a number of functions. It will frame policies for regulating medical institutions and medical professionals of the Indian systems of medicine, assessing the requirements of healthcare related human resources and infrastructure, ensuring compliance by the state medical councils of ISMs of regulations made under the bill, and ensuring coordination among the autonomous boards set up under the bill. Now in 2016, CII or the Confederation of Indian Industry estimated the total market size of Indian Ayurveda industry at 3 billion US dollars. This includes Ayurveda products and services including classical, ethical, over-the-counter, personal care and beauty products as well as medical well-being, fair and medical tourism services. The product market, well, is obviously larger and the industry is envisioned to grow to US dollars 9 billion by the year 2022. Now, this is uh, about the same pattern that we see. If you take a look at registered medical practitioners in ISMs as of 2001, we had a total of 6,81,124, of which 4,27,504 were from Ayurveda, followed by Yunani, Siddha, Homeopathy, uh, followed by Homeopathy, Yunani, Siddha, and then natu Naturopathy. So, similarly, we can see some kind of market size and growth across the subsectors within this uh, uh, area of ISMs. Now, as a result, you see this whole thing is something I stated to tell you that there is a pressure on business and ISMs. And this leads to a nexus of practices. So we can see that many kinds of plant-based treatments are often clubbed under Ayurveda. Also, they are very important to the business practices in India where they seem to have one of the largest roles to play in international trade. Having said that, it is also true that ISMs are being clubbed together since they can be a part of a larger sales unit without an overall definition and also being checked out as being part of an overall trend towards a better and healthier lifestyle. So people are getting onto the bandwagon and the bandwagon is being increasingly, while there is partitioning within, overall, they're trying to club things together so that things can just sell under the uh, brand name. In fact, a resurgence of herbal medicines was felt by some authors. And this is part of a subtext where Western or allopathic medicines are considered to be hegemonic and having major side effects. They're supposed to subvert the body systems, use excessive force and medicinal power to deal with the supposed illness, and also damage the body in their rush to get at the root or cause of the illness. One narrative in Western treatment of illness has often been that the bad cells are killed with a few good cells in the body by the treatment, 
but the good cells grow back while the bad cells do not. On the other hand, ISMs as well as indigenous medical systems in other countries did not have such bad adverse reactions or harmful side effects on the body, apparently. In a perfect world then, herbal organic medicines were the good guys and allopathic medicines became the bad guys. This led to a massive increase in sales in health and wellness products with India becoming a major player. And so you see that there is a politics in medical systems and there is a hegemony in healing practices. So this injustice has been meted out through a policy of business practices and a set of lobby enthusiasts who have ensured that regulations in such areas prefer the business practices that have given large profits. Over the years, the pharma lobby has had tremendous influence until they were brought down through a set of litigations and rules that curtailed their power to some extent in some of the countries. The power then went to the next layer in the echelon. Herbal medicines were then marketed, researched and appropriated using the same unethical practices used by the allopathic lobby. This has become the second layer, neither giving up on these issues. Sometimes the same company sold both kinds of products tested and conducted in the same way. So anthropologists have always been with the underdog in most cases. In this case, in their theory as well as in practice, they turned out to be naive. The first thing they were wrong about was in dealing with medical practices in allopathic work as being monolithic and having a set of practices that could be labeled as being one system. This was definitely not true. Having dealt with the enemy as if it was one thing, it continued to see the alternative as being a large and inquiet mass of products, having certain common ideas that link them up. I'll very briefly go to this. So, so Rabik, uh, there, yeah. four, minutes, four minutes if you can wind up, please. Okay, so I'll, uh, you can uh, read that from the book. I will talk about the adverse reactions and the alternative systems first. That over the years and right from 1990, mind you, 1990, we've had publications about adverse reactions to all of these ISMs in one way or the other. There was initially cases that patients with certain kinds of diseases were not supposed to take these drugs. Today, but not in India, abroad, people are automatically looking at, and I have a case to just tell you about this. And this case is from 2018. And I've just got the data uh, last night. In one recent event, a PIO in the USA was taking Ayurvedic drugs for his 10 year old son for type one diabetes. Doctors in the USA advised him to get checked for metal levels, heavy metal levels, since he was taking Ayurvedic drugs. Now this was something that occurred naturally to them that if you're taking uh, Ayurvedic drugs, you should check up on your metal levels. The levels of lead were found to be much higher than the natural and I checked. 10 micrograms per deciliter of blood was the normal and his number was above 70, 70, 70. He was given chelation theory, uh, therapy in hospital and, uh, well, he was cured. But you can see the range and extent of this problem that over here, we are not proposing treatment, not proposing any kind of checks on Ayurvedic drugs of this kind at all. As medical anthropologists, we are all promoting a set of drugs that have not only heavy metals, but they have also problems with arsenic and other issues. 
there are also contraindicated in many uh, kinds of uh, you know health uh, uh, systems or health issues so in conclusion then i would like to say that it is time perhaps for anthropologists in india to rethink their biomedical and other paradigms relating to medical anthropology uh, joshi sir in 2019 has given a host of commendable reasons why tribal medicines are more acceptable to many people than other systems having said that there are many reasons why we should be wary in promoting and supporting systems of medicine that have a potential to harm others he just stated that we should be critical about the way we approach these systems in my opinion then isms whether herbal tribal and ayurvedic medicines including unani siddha tibetan and homeopathy need to be analyzed critically by anthropologists using the same principles that we use to analyze allopathic and other systems of medicine further as anthropologists one should analyze allopathic systems using the same principles used for isms looking for systems of belief and logic within medical practices may be a good goal however there should not be a hindrance in looking for actual truth practices our basic guiding principles should not blind us to inconsistencies and issues where a holistic system may be interrupted by actual practices at the ground level the medical anthropology that we practice today is urgently in need of fresh paradigmatic approaches that are informed by current researches on the topic rather than those that perpetuate our own biases and are subject to public whims and fancies it should look within forward and outward to newer regimes of healthcare that are not yet proposed through the practices of today we really urgently need these today as we look through a covid infested world where our current healthcare systems showed signs of stress wear and tear a predictive science of health practices is the only suitable goal for an anthropology of human behavior that intends to use its knowledge for the good of human kind thank you thank you so much uh, professor abig for this wonderful presentation uh, next uh, presentation is by professor sunita reddy and she will be presenting on healers hut action plan to recognize and revive herbal healing practices in sikkim northeast india so over to you professor sunita okay. thank you so much dr prashant i hope you can see the screen yes your screen is visible okay um, so good afternoon everyone it's a pleasure to speak today among uh, the very dignitaries uh, and it's an honor for me to speak in, on the occasion of professor pc joshi's uh, retirement uh, occasion and i'm also thankful to delhi university for uh, bringing my paper in this uh, volume uh, i mean uh, me uh, my uh, my work related to uh, medical anthropology and disasters very much overlap with professor joshi and uh, i've been interacting and discussing with sir on lot of occasions and i've learned a lot in fact uh, uh, while we worked on disasters i see disasters of course we see lot of losses but then disasters also uh, throw up lot of opportunities now the very program today the national seminar you can imagine how seamlessly it is being conducted from the department and uh, sitting from home both dr avitoli and dr mari uh bringing it uh, the inaugural session so seamlessly and having you know uh, pc joshi and other uh, head of the department in the vicinity of the department at the same time you have scholars from east professor behra west uh, professor mutakkar 
my long lost lost friend sumati from south and so many around i think this is something which is an opportunity we have all learned uh, post covid and uh, of course i am mindful of the digital divide uh, because as teachers we are not really you know reaching out to the far flung area and where then there's no network and especially from the marginalized sections where uh, children are not able to or students are not able to connect to the internet today with this little uh, you know contextual uh, point i just wanted to uh, take you all to my uh, presentation uh, i won't be going into the details but again i'm actually not uh, looking specifically on sikkim i want to really bring in other uh, two states which i studied in northeast both arunachal and uh, manipur and uh, this is going to be published in the book uh, so i won't go into the details but let me uh, just talk about the hierarchies which professor joshi and also uh, my uh, earlier speaker uh, talked about the hierarchies of healing systems and very well as you all know even uh, you know though biomedicine is very recent uh, in evolution but then it has the dominance and it has the state patronage across the world and all the codified systems whether it's biomedicine or ayurveda or yunani siddha they all have the written texts they are professional courses uh, and certified and uh, being state patronage which are not so much with the non codified system so i'll be speaking more on the non codified systems the folk uh, healing traditions and you can see the hierarchy when you look at biomedicine that's on the top they look down upon the ayush all the uh, he indigenous healing systems and further down ayush looks down upon the folk healing that i'm saying uh because i have seen uh, in my own research how the systems have the whole hierarchy in place and this if you see these uh, um posters on the right these i just clicked for 3 4 months back uh, on the way to ito where you have the office of indian medical association and it brings out clearly that they are not uh, interested in any kind of other healing systems even though people have been you no know, taking kada taking you no know, ayurveda or even doing yoga or, and uh, many other natural pathies now here if you look at ayurvedic ayurveda ka ant mixopathy ke sang you no know, stop mixopathy similarly mishran aur khichdi ka prayog band kare mixopathy ka ant kare which talks about that it's a khichdi i mean it's like looking down upon the other healing systems though they have been there for ages and uh, people are uh, uh, you know rational enough to go and seek these treatments if they find solutions otherwise why would they be existing so it's not that they are not efficacious they are but then if you uh, try to measure try to measure they, if you if you are if you, if trying you, to evaluate uh, with the biomedical system of r and d and clinical trials then these systems may not uh, test the trials there there have to be a different kinds of you no know, um, checking the efficacy now uh, when you look at uh, the healing systems they have been uh, given uh, with various names like complementary alternate medicine indian systems of medicine and ayush an acronym which stands for ayurveda yunani siddha homeopathy and yoga now uh, i won't go into details about ethno medicine which as anthropologists all of you know that it's basically refers to the wide range of healthcare practices and beliefs and therapeutic techniques which people follow and the diseases progress uh, and the treatment seeking behavior which anthropologists study we all uh, try to understand from the people's perspective and uh, one of the study which i conducted recently in 2019 uh, across these three states was supported by ignca and we wanted to do more of a qualitative research i i won't say it's an ethnographic research though i wanted to work because that was the plan for 3 years but then because of covid and all it was winded up in one uh, year looking at three uh, different states and trying to understand from 20 healers mostly herbal healers across these three states and also from the forest officials biodiversity boards and uh, many other uh, no uh, key informants 
before going to the field, I had workshops with the IGNC and also scholars who are working in these fields to understand the Northeast. Because again, uh, if you have not been to Northeast, it's the most diverse uh, region with so many ethnic groups, so many languages. So without uh, help of the local research scholars, uh, it's impossible to do any research over there. So there were a lot of suggestions which came in before going to the field and uh, taking all those suggestions when we landed, of course, my own uh, PhD student who belongs to that place and was working with the healers was also very helpful in Sikkim, especially now the other two states and other two states I had to really look for uh, university support to you know, carry out this research. So the workshops which were carried out in IGNC brought in many aspects which were taken care. Similarly, when we reached to different uh, universities in these three states, we also had interaction with the Department of Anthropology and Department of other, uh, uh, other departments, especially in Manipur and uh, Technical University in Alo in Arunachal. And we had good interactions with both scholars and students to understand the local context uh, the uh, belief systems and also uh, interactions with the healers. Now, uh, as you all know, diversity, if you look at Sikkim is the most uh, diverse with natural bounty. Topography is too uh, undulating. Uh, it's almost 8,000 square uh, feet when you, you have to climb. Each village is on one hill. And it used to take the whole day to reach to one healer. And we used to stay with the healer for the night and you know, interview, in-depth interviews, observations, you know, many other tools which we use in uh, anthropology. And um, then again, set to you know, go to another healer the next day. And that's how the whole field work was carried out. We also uh, interacted with Mountain Institute and Sikkim Biodiversity Board trying to understand the local cultures, the, the ethnic communities, the Sikkimese communities, which are mostly by Lepchas, Bhutias, and Nepalese, and their food culture. So all these were documented both visually and uh, written to text. And uh, there were many healers. In fact, most of these healers uh, were very, very well known. Uh, and uh, they are named uh, with, uh, uh, I mean, they have their own local name, like Dhami, Jakris, Pendogma, Bombo, and Nepali, you no know, uh, folk healers. And similarly, uh, other uh, uh, communities, they had their own uh, original names, which we try to understand. The healers workshop also actually helped a lot to understand their views. And when you look at most of these healers, uh, though uh, are well known in their own region uh, and are the first uh, referral for all the people and when you look at uh, uh, Sikkim, it, because of the mountainous regions, almost every other village had one bone setter. And they were all using the herbal and with, with some bit of crude technology, though there was some bit of, uh, like one can say, integration where some of the healers were also using stethoscope. They were able to read the x-rays and uh, uh, trying to you know, help the people. And none of them were charging any fixed fees. It was all up to the patients to pay whatever they have to pay. So they were uh, basically the ones who were there for the, uh, for the local people for their primary level care. Now, uh, the workshops were held at Neftu uh, in Alo and uh, all, the, all, the, all the rituals were followed. And one of the good things which we observed was the community living, which uh, unfortunately is not there many, in many parts of the country now anymore. This house was built in two days. The whole village comes together to build a house. And then again, they, they reciprocate the same with the others. So these are some of the very interesting aspects of you know, um, community living. And uh, the healers are not just the you know, healers, but they are one of the you know, uh, well-known priests also. For every other uh, aspects, they are consulted by the community. And many of them stated that the uh, healing powers comes through dreams. And it's also basically, they are the chosen ones who have these divine powers to treat the people. And uh, there are nerve healers. And especially when you look at all the healers, they have their own specialization, which we, we, we can see in biomedicine. So there are some who are, in, uh, who are into snake uh, uh, poison treatment. There are bone setters. There are someone who is 
uh, good at uh, treating the women and children issues. So thereby, there are many healers uh, who are very well known. Uh, Ligo, she is very, very well known in Arunachal and she lives in Pasighat where there is uh, this National Institute of Folk uh, Medicine. And even the bureaucrats and many other you know, officials suggested her name. And she, uh, when we uh, interviewed her, her only point was that I just follow the nature. I, I, I mean, in fact, I travel along with the animals to see what they eat and how they heal themselves. And that's where, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and very interestingly, most few of the healers, actually, when you look at, they've been also using Facebook. If you go with this name, you'll see the Facebook and where her stories, her healing, and she also claims to heal the cancer patients. So uh, thereby one can see the, the mix of the modern technology which the healers, some of them are using. Now, interestingly, this Northeast Institute of Folk Medicine, which is under Ayush, was started uh, in the uh, previous regime. And uh, but unfortunately, <clears throat> it's not that functional. It's an indoor, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, a, um, inpatients facility with 50 beds but then uh, the director said that they don't have a watchman and there are no nurses there are only four or five healers who are treating and in this was again on the right uh, in front of us a small baby came crying and the mother told that this baby has been you know, sick and been crying for a long time and the healer just rubbed her chin on the back of the boy and you can see that the uh, boy cr uh, stopped crying and when we asked the mother, is this the first time you're coming? She said, no, I've been coming here. And whenever the baby comes here, feels better. So we are not really sure what exactly is treating the babies and what makes people come here again and again. But the unfortunate part was that having such an institution with 50 bedded hospital, still uh, we are not putting enough. And there were also complaints that uh, uh, a homeopathy doctor is heading. Why not an Ayurvedic doctor heading the institution rather than a homeopathy doctor so and 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 uh, the whole process of treating the patients is a very hard work when you look at the healers it's not that easy and despite putting so much of hard work of getting all the medicines from the forest you no know, drying them pounding them and treating them they hardly take any money and uh, across 60 healers i haven't seen more than six healers who are better off more than 55 are only sustain, I mean, sustaining, in fact, uh, because of uh, their healing, despite having so much of powers of healing people, where uh, people from across the region, not just Northeast, but there are people who are coming from other regions to get healed, he, healed to these uh, uh, healers. And they were still not charging. And, and the whole belief that if they start charging, if they become commercial, then they are not going to be so effective. So that was very much uh, clear. And uh, in fact, when you look at uh, uh, other healers in uh, the Manipur area, uh, there is a Maiba Maibi association in Manipur. Uh, but then now the, that association is not so functional, but they were in at one point of time demanding a lot. In, on the right is the healer uh, who only uses herbal medicines to treat uh, kidney stone. And behind him are all the small pipit uh, which he collected, the stones which he had removed from the patients. And he was jokingly saying that I had three, four international patients, but I couldn't collect their stones. And he is uh, 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 awarded Padma Shri. And similarly, on the left is another healer who does not even use herbal medicine. It's all with his hands that, you know, with the massage, he treats people. And in front of us, the DCP of Manipur came for treatment and he sits morning around seven in his clinic until nine in the night, treats more than 100 patients and he just charged 100 rupees. And he has a big vision to treat uh, the paralytic, uh, you know, after stroke, the paralytic body. And then he, he says that he wants to open up a bigger you know, space where he can treat more people, but then he doesn't have any support uh, or any other government support for that matter. So these Professor are. Sunita, you have five more minutes, please. Yeah, sure. So uh, these are other healers across Northeast uh, Manipur who have invested their own money to make small places where they can heal people. 
And uh, uh, coming from public health background, uh, we can see that uh, many of these uh, three tier systems which do not reach to the rural areas and many of the public health centers and uh, even sub centers are hardly functional, leave about the you know, uh, very remote areas. Healers are the ones who take care of the people at the primary level care and they are very rational. It's not that they spoil the cases if they are not able to handle like the other earlier one who said who is a massage person. He said that I don't treat any patients if they have cuts or if, if he see blood. He can only cure the internal injuries. Similarly, when you look at uh, uh, the other healers, they all had their own uh, uh, specialities. Now, I want to just talk about uh, the Indian Biodiversity Act 2002, which came in, talks about the access and benefit sharing. And uh, uh, it also talks about uh, giving uh, due recognition to the healers. And interestingly, uh, the Ayush department has been conducting research across the nation and doing audio uh, visual documentation of all the healers. So most healers said that Ayush department and many others who come and document their knowledge, but then none of them came back to give any, uh, any acknowledgement or even any support. And uh, they have started doubting the intention of even the Ayush ministry. And when we spoke to Ayush officials also, they also said this, yes, we have been documenting. We are trying to see the practices of the healers and match with the Sanskritic texts to see if the Ayurvedic, if those matches the Ayurvedic formulation. If not, then they don't do anything. But if it, if it matches, then they don't do anything. If it doesn't, and if it's a new innovation, then they send it for further research. But so far, they haven't got back to these healers to say that their, you know, um, their uh, formulations are of value. And that's where the healers are feeling very, uh, uh, in a way, anxious about their knowledge being taken away. Now, uh, all these things which I have already spoken, let me come to the uh, uh, way forward. In fact, if you look at, I think, this is high time to understand that there is a plurality of the systems in the in the country. There is an hierarchy, but if we want to achieve the sustainable development goals and we want to have universal health coverage, we need to recognize that the importance of the folk healing practices, which have been existing for ages and still people believe. And not just believe, they go back and they do get uh, you know, uh, solutions from there. And as Professor Joshi said, for Ayurveda and uh, homeopathy, all the, uh, the allergies are taken care of. We also have our own personal experiences with, related to that. I mean, we need to, as anthropologists, I suppose we have a major role to play to advocate with the ministries and departments to showcase the healers, the tribal healers, the folk healers and their importance. We need to also have some actionable strategies and maybe write to the authorities and uh, it started, I mean, Quality Control India uh, quali uh, and uh, I mean, QCI, FRLHT and Northeastern Christian University started certifying the healers. But then these, these are only voluntary basis. They need to be proactive to uh, identify healers and go and give them certification so that they are recognized. So the, these are required. And one, one uh, suggestion which I wanted to really give in was the creation of healers hut where the healers of a panchayat can sit together because when, when the bone uh, fractures come, they need to admit for at least 15 days to one month, uh, some support by the state to make healers hut where the healers can sit and uh, treat the patients at the same time, support them monetarily to carry out their medicinal garden and also give them some kind of machines which are important because they use food machines like pounding machines and all so that they can practice their healing uh, which is actually beneficial for the local people so with this these words i would like to thank everyone and also thank uh, the department for giving me an opportunity thank you so much thank Appreciate you so much uh, professor sunita for this wonderful presentation and also very important recommendations uh, next in the presentation is uh, uh, Dr. Avitoli G. Zemo, and she will be presenting on Zoopharmacognosy, Dreams and Incantations, Indigenous Healing Practices Among the Zemi Naga. 
So over to you, Dr. Avitoli. Okay, I think she will be uh, present in the comment. Can't hear you, Avitoli. Prashant, is uh, am I not audible? Yes, you are audible. I mean the video. I mean the pre-recorded. Yes, lecture. video was also audible. Go ahead. We can't hear you, Avitoli. Avitoli, we can't hear you. Prashant, some of us can't hear her. There's no sound at all. For me too. For me too. I'm unable to hear her. I think it's audible to some, but not audible. Okay, all right. Um, the audio is a, li a little low. You actually you have to turn up a volume from your side, but since it is not working i think i will just do live and uh, then that means i will not be able to show the videos and the pictures that i have put in the video all right so here i go uh prashant uh, please feel free to stop me okay because uh, i am i actually my, my lecture was for 14 minutes but if i you know do it live it may go beyond that all right thank you Okay, so uh, my topic is on Zoophamagognosy, dreams and incantation, indigenous healing practices among the Zeme Naga. So like the Zeme is uh, one of the Naga tribes. They possess a great wealth of ethnomedical knowledge. Their healing beliefs and practices have been analyzed uh, based on the field work that I conducted way back in 2015. It's a small village called Impa. It is in the Indian state of Manipur. So understanding of the Zeme concept uh, understanding of Zemi conception of health, illness and healing is attempted and the recent changes brought about by biomedicine owing to construction of road and other development activities uh, have been analyzed. But I've specifically identified two case studies. Um, the case study of a bone setter who learned his art from a bird called uh, Raven and a shaman whose uh, whose deceased father taught healing practices through her dreams. Um, all these two cases have been taken up to elucidate the medical pluralism that exists in Azeme village. I will skip all the theory part. Um, the use of plants as medicine for various ailments is not new to the tribes of Northeast India and it is very clear from uh, Professor Reddy's presentation as well. Now, um, before the advan advent of modern allopathy, we, you see that the various tribes in the Northeast India, they depended on traditional healers who knew medicinal plants and the ability to fix fractured bones. And the forces of globalization have been instrumental in ushering changes in many um, communities and Zemenaga is no exception. The traditional lifestyle, including consumption and healing practices, is undergoing a transition. But sometimes in conundrum as the traditional beliefs clashes with modern ideas or new religious principles. Now, where, who are the Zemenaga? Most of you may not know that. Now, the Zeme is one of the Naga tribes, and they live in three states of India's northeast, the state of Nagaland, Manipur, and Assam. Now, since India's independence in 1947 and the creation of different states subsequently, you find that the Zeme people, they, despite living in one contiguous area, have been divided into three different states, and this division of their population has affected the Zeme tribe politically and socially. And there are more than 200 of uh, Zeme villages and towns across these three states. But 
the Zeme always remains at the periphery and always being marginalized on all fronts due to inadequate political representation. Now, there are about 100,000 population of Zeme people in total, and like any other tribes in transition, they practice different <coughs> religions like Christianity, Papo Rene, or Papo I say these are traditional religions, and also um, Haraka. Now, the Zeme speak the dialect, which I don't understand. It is called Zeme. It belongs to the Sino-Tibetan language group as well. So similar to other Naga tribes, you find that there is a group participation, which is a significant feature of Zeme social life, like be it collection of firewood, wild fruits from the forest, or agricultural activities in the fields. Actually, I had lots of videos to show, to show you, but it is now a part of the video, and that is not audible to you guys. So I'm sorry for that. So they go in group, they return in groups. Now, this sense of togetherness influences value systems related to different social institutions thereby manifest mm, manifesting in decision making norms laws distribution of resources acquisition of knowledge healing etc so by locating the traditional system of healing in the network of other social institutions let us try to understand the cultural conception of health within the Zeme society now the field work which I talk to you about is just very short field work because as you all know for for all of us who are in the university it is very difficult to to get along break you know to conduct research and so on so it was the outcome of field work conducted in a small village in pine to in 2015 and um this comes under tosem subdivision in tamenglong district in the state of manipur but if you look at the map it is towards the boundary of nagaland state and um you know due to absence of shared language i used uh, i made use of a video camera to record the interview and relied on an interpreter i request the co-host of the zoom to mute other participants please Okay, coming to concept of illness and health, there are two terms that I need uh, that I will. Uh, the one is mate and one is mane. Now, these two terms that uh, they, yes, these two terms connote different types of bodily afflictions for Zeme, and uh, they indicate mild and severe conditions of illness, respectively. So, a person is described as mate, M A T E I, mate when he or she has feelings of pain or discomfort that is there can be multiple factors or symptoms responsible for this condition now appetite is often considered as an indicator of mate because some experience a reduced appetite while for others it is enhanced so being in the state of mate does not necessarily restrain one from carrying out activities related to their everyday life now in most cases it is the persistence of mate condition that leads to the confirmation of mane the other term i um, you know the other term that is money or the departure from the mind body equilibrium so now you see that the second term money it denotes the inability to take part in everyday activities and the person is confined within the walls of the house now this involves changes in social roles therefore entry into the sick role now for zemi people health is described as a condition when where one can take part in the livelihood activities normally without any hindrances however a perspective that is passed on from forefathers revealed that health is a peaceful atmosphere achieved by pleasing the spirits and blessings from god i'm not using uh, local terms but i'm just using um, english equivalent words now this hints at the logic behind their different causation beliefs and healing techniques now coming coming again to the um, I'm skipping so much I'm coming directly to the to the case study the first case study is learning from a uh, raven raven is a bird the black one now the case of a bone setter the Zeme of Impa village, they are dependent on local healers, local divine healers for immediate relief from their ailments. Now, as case study of a local bone setter revealed how he learned the art of making medicine using locally available herbs and plants from a raven. Now, this person name is Rajay Pame. Um, he is around 50 years old. He's a bone setter in Impa village. Now, he gets patients from all over the neighboring villages. How he came to master this setting is quite intriguing. It seems one fine day, he came across the nest of Ngak. Ngak is, means raven, and uh, the, the nest of a ra raven. And then he saw some you know, small chicks in the nest. So he, he broke one of, the leg, uh, one of the legs of the young chicks and he hit himself. So when the mother raven saw that her young one's leg is broken, she flew away and she brought back varieties of herbs and plant leaves so every day the men observed the mother nursing back her young one to health so eventually it seems the young chick recovered and flew away this is the record of uh, i have this in record 
Now, after observing for many days, it seems the man collected all the leftover herbs and he starts searching for the same in the village. Uh, no, not village, in the jungle. Now, he collected the herbs and he that was you that were used by the mother raven and experimented with um, them on a human being. And he said it worked. And these locally available herbs could fix broken bones, according to him. And uh, we, I was directed to this person because it like snowballed. And I was asking who are the bone setters in the village, and people vouch for his authenticity. Now the man was unable to identify the names of the herbs. He he brought eleven herbs, but he had no idea what they are. He had no idea what they were called in his dialect. But this is understandable because the village impa. Um, is very rich in vegetation and hundreds of species do not even have names in their own dialect so learning from animal self-medication has been reported in other papers in scientific papers too now this the science of animal male um, self-medication is called zoo pharmacognosy and this word is derived from uh, zoo pharma and nosy zoo means animal pharma is drug and nosy is knowing so as per the paper that i reviewed now 2014 it is not clear how much knowledge or how much learning is involved but many animals seem to have evolved an inherent ability to sense the medicinal constituents in plants now these are not my words the evidence may be circumstantial but the examples are plenteous like Rajab Ames findings which I uh, noted in 2015 so shirking in his paper he went on to talk about how um, he's a science reporter he's I mean science writer and he reported that many animal species have their own medicine from ingredients that are commonly available in nature and he cited Michael Huffman 1997 a biologist who argued that chimps chimpanzee were self-medicating he observed how a parasite ridden chimpanzee in Tanzania chewed the leaves of a toxic plant that has rough leaves and the plant the plant is not even a part of a regular diet but the next day uh, the chimpanzee was completely okay or recovered so Huffman theorized that the chimps were consuming the plants to burnish their intestines and relieve themselves of parasites so the scientists researching zoopharmacognosy perceive that humans can learn from animals especially in identifying new medications and this paper also talk about how the folk medicine in small-scale societies might have come from medicine man observing animals self-medicate Likewise, Raja Pame, my informant, the, his ingredients for setting bones are identified based on observation of the mother raven in action. Now coming to the second part of dreams. Now dreams and shamans. Uh, again, in the same village, in the Impa village, I was led to a young woman who who the village uh, thinks that he she is quite credible because she can heal people um, so I call her as female shaman and she inherited healing abilities from her father who died when she was 11 years old so her name is Maine Liu Pame she was 11 years old when her father passed away and since the father was a very renowned man in the hills of Manipur Nagaland and Assam and he could heal people using indigenous herbs and plants well she recollected how his death left a big void in her life but this girl when she attained the age of 18 years she, she told me and it's recorded in the camera that she had a dream and her father appeared to her in her dream and told her that he will reveal his secret of healing but he made her promise never to disclose a secret to anybody not even her mother so she received instructions from her deceased father in her dream and when he when she woke up she obeyed his instructions and uh, she was able to heal people using prescribed herbs and plants and she said that it has been more than seven years that was way back in 2015 uh, more than seven years that she has been he healing people and she claimed that um patients from the village and neighboring surrounding villages have been cured of kidney stones cancer spinal pains and so on now in her village there was no medical dispensary or a primary health center till 2014 for hundreds of neighboring villages, she was their immediate source of getting help. Now, she said that she does what she can to relieve and cure people, and she attributed her gift to God only. So this uh, woman, she added that she has never disclosed her ingredients because she promised her father never to do that. And I find that while doing some kind of review, um, you know, shaman being created in her dreams of father, it is also reported among the parentine Indians of Brazil too. They believe that dreaming is a special domain of shaman for they were created in the dreams of older shamans. The details will be in the essay that I have written in honor of Professor Joshisa.
thirdly and the third and the last one incantation so incantation is the chanting of series of words to cast a spell or to heal an ailed man it's not new to the zeme in fact in one of the zeme villages that uh, the department of anthropology du went last year in the month of january we we, we found out that the incantation is still practiced in that village but uh, the village that i am talking about right now is also a zeme village in impa the incantation is not encouraged anymore you know those who were familiar with incantation they voluntarily gave up so as not to antagonize the church now there is a tendency for the converts to look at incantation as something evil or opposed to christian beliefs however certain illnesses can also be cured can only be cured by incantation as believed by the people now i met a young man he narrated how he got stung by a bee during you know while hunting and he told was just a bee, bee sting but when he reached home he was in so much pain and his relatives who saw him remarked that it was not a simple bee sting but it but uh, the evil has entered into his bloodstream via a bee sting and hence the unbearable pain so in circumstances like this incantation was usually sought in pre-christian days now there is a um 80 year old man his photographs I do have and his name is Haile Pame and he used to be a special he used to be specialized in incantation but he voluntarily gave up after converting to Christianity he was requested by the young man's relatives to please perform uh, incantation and he reluctantly agreed just because he did not wish to see a young man you know of his grandson's age withering in pain so after he performed the pain went away and this and the young man was up and well the next morning so when it comes to healing the church also has its prayer warriors and counselors who claim to heal people through their prayers so you find that in this village very small village of 100 households the practices of previous faith might have discontinued but in a given circumstance they have been sought again for immediate relief so in this impa village the coexistence of both traditional and uh, spiritual healing practices is still evident i will leave all the ethical question now i will come to the intervention of western bi biomedicine as i've said earlier this particular village impa it had no road no primary health center till 2014 and only in 2014 a primary health center was established um by the in the name of uh, haitung and it has been run uh, with the help of Corona Trust. So some philanthropists donated building materials, even an ambulance and so on. So this primary health center, or nowadays it is called as Haitung Memorial Hospital, it has got one full-time doctor and two nurses. But when I talked to the nurses, the nurses revealed that despite the presence of a primary health center, the villagers hardly visit. They prefer to stick to the traditional methods of healing. And only in case of life and death situation, they come to the hospital. Um, now, vaccination, you know, when in, in, in the during the field work, I, I came to realize that now most of the children in the village were not vaccinated. Um, and I think it, it is also due to inaccessibility terrains without proper road and, and the health workers were not able to get access to many Zeme villages um, before 2014 because there was no road. You know but with the coming of the road you find that people from the village have started going out to other parts of the country for studies for work so now when COVID-19 pandemic emerged all those who were staying outside they had to return to the village um so uh, to, to cut the long story short yes just two minutes all right so what happens is the returnees were allowed to enter the village only after 14 days of quarantine that that was the normal thing now till today not even a single case of covid 19 rather yesterday one nurse texted me that um they the village received 100 uh, pp uh, that kids for testing and then they um they tested 34 people but all all the people whom they tested were all negative so now the, now the problem is giving them to avail covid vaccination was another hurdle as people who are mostly christians were apprehensive that the vaccine may be the mark of the beast and the, and remember now the village has excellent internet connectivity just imagine 2014 no road no health care but now 2021 they have excellent internet connectivity airtel 4g so every household has smartphones now social media has become a medium that adds more fuel to the fear that is already there so with the intervention of the educated members of the village who are residing in towns and cities and also direct intervention by their elected member of autonomous district council the villagers have availed uh, COVID vaccination as of today and it is important to understand that they are no longer isolated like before and the risk of getting infected is not unlikely. Uh, to conclude, I must say that the current status of healthcare in Zeme village can be described under the rubric of medical pluralism. Although biomedicine dependence has enhanced over the years, they still utilize uh, ethnomedicinal knowledge for a variety of ailments. So 
especially when it comes to traditional bone setting practices they prefer it to biomedical treatment and uh, if you have to look into it remember till 2014 they had this self and local dependency so this local dependency has not ceased despite the introduction of biomedicine or hospital so this present paper does not intend to counter the efforts made by made by government and charitable agencies to provide medical health care service to the people uh, of impoverished but rather it is an attempt to emphasize the need to recognize the cultural implications of medicine and um, this the Zeme ethnomedical knowledge comprises key insights which are specific to their ecology and culture which cannot be ignored while planning health care strategies for the village um, so in my paper I have dealt actually with two different villages so the details everything will be in the book that was written in honor of professor PC Joshi so please when the book is out please buy the book as well uh, so it's uh, it's over from my side Prashant thank you very much all of you for patiently listening thank you uh, thank you so much Dr. Avitoli for this very interesting uh, presentation and uh, we are definitely going to read your work uh, uh, next uh, in line is uh, Professor S. Sumathi, and she will be speaking on health and wellness, a perspective and a case study from Tamil Nadu. So over to you, uh, Professor Sumathi. And uh, just to uh, talk about the time, we have half an hour left for this session. And yes. I think if time permits, then we can take up some questions in the at the end of this session, I, because I could see some in the chat box, but if the chair permits, then only. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Prashant. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for providing me this uh, wonderful opportunity. And I really wanted to humbly submit uh, that uh, uh, Professor Joshi is the person who has given me a wonderful opportunity to connect with the, uh, the Delhi, uh, particularly I could say where I had uh, met all the scholars, great scholars, uh, so that I've learned so much. Uh, and at this juncture, I always uh, uh, you know, with wholeheartedly felt that I should uh, submit my thanks to Professor Joshi and uh, uh, taken this as a wonderful opportunity to present my uh, uh, views, uh, particularly uh, on uh, health, though I have not claimed myself as a medical anthropologist, uh, uh, but as a community uh, study and uh, deeply involved in ethnographic studies, uh, is uh, every time uh, health played uh, a very, very vital role and uh, the whole ethnographies and my content analysis uh, as uh, every time reveals the relevance of health. And uh, this is a very, very recent uh, study uh, given to me by the uh, uh, government of Tamil Nadu and uh, the thick uh, descriptions uh, and uh, contains so much of, uh, of um, health and wellness related uh, components uh, and the way the communities were uh, uh, struggling hard to establish their identity. And uh, definitely I'll uh, uh, try to stick to my time and uh, the title of my paper as uh, Prashant said is health and wellness. I'm trying to understand the perspective uh, through the case studies. Next, shall I? Dr. Sumati, you are mute. Okay. Can I can, now, just now or yeah. previously? No, no, just now, just now you. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Sorry, sorry. Wellness and health are universal, which has been proved right from the day one when all the speakers has, uh, has uh, talked about it. Uh, and every community and the case studies presented by Sunita Avitoli and everybody has proved how every community organizes the material means and intangible cultural elements and develop their own techniques in order to establish the, their own health institutions. Traditional cultures had sophisticated healthcare systems and aimed for balanced of body, mind and spirit. That's what uh, this is the one point uh, point uh, even in uh, keynote address uh, as uh, Professor Joshi has uh, well established uh, the interconnectivity between body, mind and spirit. Uh, wellness is an application and extent beyond uh, on the preventive healthcare promotion and in compared to biomedical uh, uh, thing. Um, wellness aims for uh, 
or uh, or happy balanced quality and uh, fulfilled uh, uh, achievement uh, achieving this uh, universal definition on wellness though it was not very successful uh, but definitely explained its uh, multiple perspective uh, uh, that i really wanted to highlight it professor sumati uh, yeah yeah okay professor sumati you are mute again i don't know whenever i uh, put the next up. okay again you are mute hmm. somebody can help me in next i think wait let me see this yeah uh good uh there are two concepts of wellness uh, which has been uh, everybody was uh, trying to talk about it one is uh, spiritual and secular again so every presenter you know like has been constantly talking about it so they are all great medical anthropologists and i was also very happy to capture these concept and the, uh, the relevance of uh, the spiritual and the secular component of uh, wellness so as uh, the spiritual is always based on uh, faith emotions and uh, spirituality and the later is based on signs and self equals and uh, and the logical thought flows uh, also so all these discourses has been very beautifully constructed and uh, talked about uh, the relevance of it one is uh, uh, the quantitative interpretations proposed health and wellness can always be in uh, in absolute opposite of illness this is the the only aspect which uh, as an anthropologist or as an uh, intensive feed worker and uh, trying to document the way of life of uh, of the communities we always feel that how this could be you no know, like uh, uh deal with it and see how best we could take up both the component of it when uh, uh, uh when uh, 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 gosh was presenting his uh, as a paper on uh, putting out uh, all these quantifications uh, and uh, it gives us a wonderful understanding uh, at the same time uh, the other presenters uh, qualitative information also gives us uh, as uh, the the ground realities uh, and this is what uh, the anthropologist has been constantly trying uh, and to achieve and trying to impose and trying to project that how scientifically we are also trying to come out with all these uh, explanations uh, wellness uh, definitely aims to help people in achieving the higher levels there are two uh, scholars uh, uh, well, my my own scholars who did their phd has talked about uh, the 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 uh, concept of uh, uh, pity and uh, and the culture of pity and uh, so those things has given so much of informations about uh, about the cancer patients and uh, and um, the 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 healing uh, and uh, concept and ultimately the wellness uh, in a holistic uh, perspective uh, definitely applied in studies has justified the relevance of illness cognition and wellness uh, from definitely from a socio cultural perspective next Uh, this is an other area where i really wanted to bring in uh, and as a very important variable in this uh, case studies uh, with particularly when i was constructing this uh, case studies uh, the component of food and food literacy as uh, say of the communities as given so much of uh, of uh, base so much of uh, of uh, uh, substantiation uh, for the their whole uh, uh, claim as an uh, or claim for their identity and hence i after taking into this concept of food literacy and its varied dimensions uh, and relating with ethnomedicines and uh, as uh, as uh, given so much of uh, understanding in uh, taking up my argument uh, in constructing this uh, is case study and ultimately i have also contributed to this uh, volume 
studies have tried to understand the relationship between food literacy and food consumption that brought out the importance of uh, hygiene and nutrition awareness with regard to health and wellness. So all studies of, uh, of uh, particularly the, 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 the qualitative studies, even the quantifications has taken this as a very important uh, variables in food consumptions and uh, and uh, uh, and the impact of, uh, of food consumptions and the concept of, uh, of uh, hot food and cold food has contributed so much in the process of uh, health and wellness. Uh, food security and food consumption established a, a, a similar association with health and wellness. As we all know what, how ethnomedicine and Western biomedical practices, many paper presenters has shown how this has been and kept it as in them dialectic opposites and uh, and ultimately put it in a hierarchical level uh, something is inferior to, uh, to or in comparative uh, mode so but definitely i could say the world development reports 2050 uh, as uh, came out with uh, this uh, component of food literacies uh, and uh, decision making process uh, what to eat and how this manufactured uh, demands of uh, food supply as created by the market and all those things they have uh, and at the same time, they were also talking about the concept of food providers and how they have contributed in the whole component of health and wellness. Food literacy can also be viewed as cultural literacy, which, is, which could be equated with culture and their perceptions and their knowledge system and their understanding and their epistemic has been well constructed in the whole process of food literacy. and taken as a very, very important component uh, in determining the health and wellness. Uh, food and community identity has also has, uh, came out, uh, out a little bit, and particularly my case study, which I'm going to present it, uh, it uh, as how the, the community has taken this component of uh, food, food providers, and their identity, and ultimately a, a given and the anthropologist, uh, the, 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 the status of engaged anthropology and ultimately the policy has been uh, in, uh, came out and uh, we, the anthropologists, were uh, coordinated in the entire process of this uh, as a community and uh, now they have been, uh, uh, their identity has been uh, redesigned and uh, redesigned and they were very happy about it uh, as the policy has came up. One is, uh, this component is also the politics of food has been constantly uh, talked about it, uh, it and uh, uh, particularly from the, uh, the, the economic discourses on procurement, production, distribution, availability, affluence, wastage, uh, scarcity of food and everything has been uh, one as it is uh, whenever you are talking about distribution and food, uh, the, the, the politics is also oh, inevitable and one has to understand from that perspective uh, culture of food, indigenous knowledge of identity, power of politics. Uh, these are the four components which I am taking and I have built up my uh, I, uh, case study and found out the interrelationship uh, in determining the concept of health and wellness. In this paper, we are trying to bring about uh, the conceptual understanding at one level and I am not going so deep into it because as an anthropologist, uh, we all have but because right from the day one, uh, you know, like starting from morning, uh, so we are uh, talking about it and I felt uh, that it is the right uh, path which I am also taking it uh, in building up and substantiating with the, my empirical evidences and case study analysis of the how the community has reaffirmed the relevance of food, food providers, knowledge system and the habitat. Uh, it, uh, and uh, and uh, Sunita's paper has talked about uh, at, uh, the habitations and their interrelations with the environment and even Avitoli's paper has talked about their, co co uh, their interrelations with the animal and all those things uh, as determined uh, and um, their uh, social status. Here they, they keep all those things and uh, claim their social status high in the hierarchy as a markers of identities at the comparative level. Next. The, the, the methodology which we applied in this uh, project is empirical approach. It is based on observation and uh, uh, with all our uh, theoretical practice experience uh, and uh, dealt with a lot of abstractions. Uh, 
the case study method was followed uh, as a part of situational analysis. Uh, the whole uh, uh, study has followed uh, qualitative research and uh, the government has very uh, particularly requested us to follow ethnographic approach in constructing uh, their uh, community uh, uh, profile of the culture. And uh, the analysis which we followed is the content directive and discourse analysis which facilitated our interpretations in right uh, scientific manner. Besides the secondary sources, uh, we have also depended upon uh, archaeological and literary evidences. Next. Yeah, this is the picture uh, that uh, the, the, uh, the community, uh, uh, the, their belief system, and uh, they consider this as their uh, god and uh, uh, Indra and uh, goddess, god Indra and Devendra, they say. The government of Tamil Nadu had requested for an ethnographic study categorized uh, as the in the nomenclature of a community uh, listed out in scheduled caste uh, of Tamil Nadu to the Department of Anthropology, University of Metas. Uh, uh, the, the community is, uh, as I said, is listed out in SE uh, list of Tamil Nadu. Uh, who were collectively claiming uh, their identity as uh, Devendra Kulavellalas. Uh, the other dominant agricultural communities who own the lands use the term uh, Billalars uh, as suffix, as a suffix, were strongly objecting the community claim and uh, the socio politically, they were uh, limiting uh, the whole process for about uh, three decades. They are fighting for this. So they are listed out in the scheduled caste of Tamil Nadu called as Pallar. This is the term which has been listed out in the uh, nomenclature or the, the scheduled caste list of Tamil Nadu. And they have been fighting for their uh, identity as Devendra Kula Vilalar uh, um, for about uh, three decades, as I said. They strongly felt that this term Pallar is a derogative uh, uh, term and uh, particularly used by the others, uh, other dominant communities, and uh, wrongly narrated their culture and ethnography, which has always undermined their knowledge system and uh, socially placed, purposefully they have been uh, placed lower and stigmatized as untouchables. This is what their uh, uh, submission, and hence constantly they were. Uh, are uh, struggling to get their right and get their right and yeah next 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 professor so uh, just five minutes if you can yeah, wind up. i'm sure i'm sure uh, the thick description data collected uh, consolidated around the agricultural knowledge system unique irrigation techniques uh, they pride as a food providers this is what i really wanted to highlight it here and as a determinant of health and wellness there are so many problems which we have been able to collect it uh, and uh, the, the 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 local uh, says and uh, the, the the short stories and every day the, it has been highlighted uh, about their uh, air claim as a food providers to the entire society and strongly felt they are the health determinants and wellness as particularly for the entire society, the other depending societies also. So they, they always strongly felt that they are the descendant of Lord Devendra, who is the rain god or the, uh, and uh, their uh, positions, uh, the pristine positions in the social structure by identifying themselves with the creator and providers. Our cable evidences provide as indigenous uh, agricultural system, which has been proved in many, many ways. And they are the indigenous agriculturist uh, and know what to produce at what uh, climate and how to maintain the health of the entire society. So copper plates and classical Tamil literatures narrated the strong relationship with the local ecology. Next. Yeah, they always think they are the custodians of wellness of the society. As food growers, uh, they ensured uh, the all-round well-being members of the society by distributing the grown crops to the entire uh, and each and every uh, family that resides in their uh, geography. It was their responsibility to provide a nutritious diet to all uh, and keep them in a healthy environment. Uh, and the modernization and uh, industry, they strongly felt that the modernization and industrialization process uh, pushed them 
to the lowest position and particularly the colonial uh, constructions uh, and uh, of this list uh, has uh, pushed them uh, um, uh, and neglected their knowledge system and undermined their uh, role as uh, food providers uh, as uh, especially when the conflict arises between this uh, is uh, dominant and uh, vulnerable communities uh, they were always uh, referred and uh, expressed uh, in a very very derogative sense uh, and suppress them suppressing all their knowledge and the entire thing so the ethnographic output has very clearly brought out uh, that they are agriculturists their knowledge system is uh, is scientific ecological integrations their water management irrigation technique uh, rice varieties which they are proud and uh, production and uh, distribution of food which is ultimately determines their health and wellness of the whole society it has been strongly put forth uh, by the community as a criteria and this has been taken by the anthropologist and uh, show it as an evidence for claiming their social evidences or social recognition uh, and, and justified them as uh, Devindra Kula Vela Larra. The community's claim as the food providers for health and wellness uh, affirmed through continuous revivalistic ethos has been justified. Uh, these identity claim of health determinants uh, received uh, universal approval at the national level, which is what the, uh, the, the Registrar General Office has also has taken it in a wonderful because uh, Again, I could say how politically it has been there because the farmers, uh, as protest was going on and all these things, when we put it in a right manner and right uh, political situations and uh, the, the Tamil Nadu government uh, elections and everything has kept it in a, uh, looked, at, uh, looked at these things in a positive uh, situations and uh, their, uh, uh, their request has been prioritized and taken it in a righteous manner. Next. Yeah, this is what, you know, ultimately I really wanted to say how this whole key study presented by the, the anthropologist to the policy makers and ultimately it has been accepted by the policy makers and now the, the community has been recognized by this term, uh, uh, their name has been recognized as Devendra Kunavadana because of their uh, er, determinant as a health determinant for the entire society. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you so much, Professor Sumati, for this very interesting presentation. And had we got more time, uh, we would have really loved to discuss and uh, on this on this more. And uh, moving to the next and the last presentation of this session, uh, I would request Dr. Sonia Kaushal to make a presentation on the title PVTG's Health Status and Health Access Livelihood Framework. Over to you, Dr. Sonia. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prashant. Uh, first, I would like to uh, give my thanks to uh, Department of Anthropology and the organizers of this national seminar, which is being held in the honor of Professor P.C. Joshi. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so um, with this, I would like to take the opportunity to um, read my paper with the permission of the chair and co-chair. The healthcare system in every country strives to provide better care and the primary health services are designed in such a manner that they are available to everyone. Access to healthcare is determined by the community's use and supply of health services. Uh, according to studies, certain communities such as uh, refugees, settlers and indigenous people are still very vulnerable. Despite the fact that various countries are taking measures to reduce health disparities, there is no globally uh, recognized concept of quote unquote equitable access. Hence, provision of comprehensive healthcare to the vulnerable people is a complicated issue. The government across the world uh, are coming up with various strategies to meet the health needs of the vulnerable people. The inequality among vulnerable tribal population is more pronounced in India because the concept of tribe in India, uh, in Indian context is debatable and complex. The concept carries not only the colonial burden and stereotypes, but it has also created a divide between the tribal and non-tribal communities. The gap is also widened the way the concept of tribe has been uh, perceived in the popular discourse. This popular discourse is value loaded and uh, value loaded with assumptions and glorifies the certain image of tribe. On the contrary, the tribal reality is far more away from what has been perceived and written. This was noted by um, 
our uh, very eminent anthropologist, uh, Professor V. K. Shirvastava in 2008. The tribal communities are not any more isolated living groups in the hilly terrains or forested areas. Tribal communities are interacting with the mainstream societies. Moreover, the rapid deforestation, conflict, loss of land, depletion of natural, economic, and social resources compel the tribals to migrate to cities in search of livelihood. The migration has no doubt ensured the survival, but has also resulted into distress, anxiety, and low healthcare access. The health system uh, represents contrasting healthcare access in India, and the extent of healthcare services disparity in vulnerable tribal population is aggravated due to livelihood insecurity. Therefore, the present paper tries to explore the uh, relationship between uh, healthcare status of PVTGs and their livelihood instability through health, care, uh, through health access livelihood framework. Now I will discuss about the health status of particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Uh, I will not go into the details of uh, uh, the concept of PVTG. Uh, I will uh, move towards the health status. The health is determined by complex interplay of economic and other related factors, so it does not exist in vacuum. The health status of vulnerable tribal population is shaped by geographical isolation, lack of education, forest destruction, land alienation, poverty, displacement, and migration. As all these factors together act as a barrier to access the healthcare services. The other hindrances to the healthcare access of the tribals are the discrimination and lack of cultural understanding and sensitivity by the health staff. Even the healthcare system uh, ignores the marginalized tribal groups, sociocultural values and traditions related to the health, as noted in a uh, UN report in 2015. The PVTGs tend to underutilize the healthcare service because the system is alien to them and it does not fit into their worldview. The habitats and social cultural matrix of PVTGs have been threatened by displacement and by ignoring their historical rights in lieu of conservation of uh, wildlife and natural resources. The main subsistence economies of PVTGs are pre-agricultural based, but developmental projects force them to uproot from their homeland. The, pro the protected area policies such as national parks, sanctuaries, conservation, reserves, etc., have uh, displaced many such uh, uh, vulnerable tribal uh, communities from their original abode and led to their impoverishment. Some of these PVTGs are even forced to ev evict the core areas of forest under Project Tiger, as noted by uh, Rao in 2015. In Achinkamar Tiger Reserve in Chhattisgarh in 2009, few Baga families had to leave their traditional source of livelihood. The Baga families were removed from the, uh, from the Tiger Reserve and rehabilitated to another place without receiving pattas for farming and compensation under the Project Tiger relocation scheme, as noted by Bera in 2012. Likewise, the Dongria tribe of Odisha's Niyamgiri Hills has been displaced and evicted from the forest, and their inability to access forest resources has had a significant effect on their socioeconomic situation. The deprivation of traditional habitat has also resulted in the forced migration of this group to the mainstream land and reduced their status to the unskilled labor workers. The health inequalities among uh, tribal communities in selected districts of Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, and Odisha are examined in a study published by Sama, Resource Group for Women and Health, titled, quote unquote, From the Margins to the Middle. The report emphasized the connection between tribal communities' poor health and social, economic, and, and political marginalization. The Sama report shows that PBTGs from Chhattisgarh, Odisha, and Jharkhand migrate to uh, larger cities on a seasonal basis. They, they work as a daily wage labor, which is a low paid and insecure. The health status of these PBTGs is severely affected by the alien environment, poor sanitation, and water facility, as well as demanding workload. Furthermore, the unawareness of health facility or unfamiliar health facility, language, loss of wage to do, uh, due to uh, visit to the health facility have adverse impact on their overall well-being. The report also highlights the health inequalities among tribal communities, tribal patients um, to, um, 
patients who are suffering from tuberculosis or sickle cell disease, their care is stopped due to migration. The migration has a particularly negative impact on pregnant women also because they do not have access to routine ANC and PNC facilities at work. The, uh, similarly, the immunization and nutrition of children are also affected. The tribes who migrate to, to cities uh, struggle to integrate into the, whole, uh, into the whole society. They have their own reservations regarding treatment process, perception regarding certain cultural specific illnesses and their traditional healing. The tribal identity and migration to the urban space has shaped new vulnerabilities. Therefore, the worsening of the health status of PVTGs is aggravated by the developmental projects and post migration. Their displacement from the traditional homeland has resulted in the loss of subsistence and forced them to migrate to the urban areas. The loss of livelihood, displacement from the homeland, and, cons and consequent constraint to mobilize the resources during ill health make PVTGs more vulnerable to disease and malnutrition. Besides, the search for new employment opportunities put these vulnerable groups to new kind of health challenges in new, new setting. Additionally, the livelihood instability hugely impacts healthcare access. The PVTGs are not able to mobilize the available livelihood resources in critical health situation due to the above cited reasons. Therefore, it becomes necessary to assess the healthcare access in the context of livelihood insecurity of PVTGs. Now I will discuss about the framework which could prove useful for the, uh, to improve the health status of uh, P PVTGs. Uh, that is health access livelihood framework. The health access livelihood framework was created in the context of malaria care in rural Tanzania as part of the access program. The framework stresses on providing high quality health care in resource poor settings especially in Africa. The framework primarily addresses healthcare access and livelihood assets, which are essential for treatment. It emphasizes that once the illness is recognized and treatment choices made, the access becomes a critical issue. The treatment process is influenced by five dimensions of access, that is availability, accessibility, affordability, adequacy, and acceptability. The interaction of healthcare services and policies as well as available livelihood resources that could be mobilized in critical circumstances determine the accessibility of health services. Therefore, the framework uh, basically integrates healthcare interventions as well as health seeking behavior and situates healthcare access within the broader context of insecurity as noted by Aubrey et al. in 2017. The health seeking behavior approach focus on the people, while health service approach focus on the factors affecting access to healthcare and livelihood approach emphasizes assets and activities needed to achieve and maintain during livelihood insecurity. Uh, in health seeking behavior approach, the social actors are considered as the main motivating factor towards healthcare access, but it has been observed that such actors are controlled by the social economical and political dynamics of the society at the macro and micro level. Livelihood insecurity plays a very important role. Um, therefore, studies related to livelihood approach demonstrate that relationship between access to household and community resources affects the strategies to cope with the illness. The livelihood resources are encompassed uh, such as human capital, social capital, uh, natural capital, physical, and financial capital. These assets are controlled by PVTGs concerning the healthcare access in relation to livelihood insecurity produced by the displacement from the traditional land, migration, minimal access to the forest re resources, and as well as in their natural habitat. According to the available literature, PVTG studies are primarily focused on particular diseases such as sickle cell anemia, G6PD deficiency, malaria, tuberculosis, and others, as well as studies relating to health-seeking behavior. However, there are few studies on healthcare access and livelihood insecurity as a result of relocation, land alienation, migration, poverty, conflict, and other factors. Therefore, the health services in the tribal areas require a comprehensive understanding of the healthcare access. It is important to explore the issue of healthcare access from the perspective of tribal people's livelihood, especially PVTG. There is a need to understand 
the health care utilization in association with the livelihood in in and PVTG. Such knowledge production may help in identifying current gaps in health policy and implementing appropriate initiatives to increase tribal community access to healthcare. Thus, in uh, vulnerable tribal communities where livelihoods are in jeopardy, providing quality healthcare is a challenge. There is a need to improve the healthcare access as well as livelihood resources for care. Therefore, if such studies are conducted by considering the health access livelihood framework, uh, will be able to assist the health system in, in addressing the health needs of the vulnerable tribal community. So here I will conclude that um, there is a need to understand the PBTG's health status and livelihood insecurity posed due to uh, developmental programs, displacement and poverty. The livelihood insecurity as, has major uh, health repercussions in terms of healthcare access and, uh, and services. The health access uh, livelihood framework can be employed to understand the healthcare access in broader context of livelihood insecurity. The framework could help in capturing the healthcare issues during economic hardships. The framework could also highlight the efficacy and gaps of the health system and how tribal people mobilize the resources in the livelihood insecurity. Thank you. Oh, thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sonia, and thank you for being well within time and so that we were able to complete at 1.30 dot. So <laughs> thank you so much for that. And so we had uh, six presentations today and uh, uh, what can I say more? And it was a treat to listen to all of them. And they all are well established in their fields of uh, knowledge and uh, uh, what Professor Joshi stood for throughout his uh, academic career in a university setting. I think all these presentations resonated very well, his concerns um, within the broader field of medical anthropology and well-being. And one thing I was just thinking while listening to all these presentations is uh, uh, that anthropology as a science of alternatives can very well be imagined through all your presentations and how this can be uh, taken up at the level of the policy and planning and how uh, these alternatives can become part of the so-called mainstream. So uh, I will not speak much and take up more of your time because we are also heading towards uh, the lunchtime and uh, uh, with these few words, uh, I would first of all like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to listen to all these wonderful presentations and I'll be there for the, uh, the, the entire day and also tomorrow. Uh, now with these words, I will like to call upon Professor A.K. Sinha, who is chairing this, uh, this session to say a few words. Over to you, sir. Okay. Dhanivad, Prasanji. You have done everything in my work. I just want to प्रोफेसर पीसी जोशी के बारे में दो शब्द कहना चाहता हूं कि कहने को तो बहुत कुछ है परंतु समय के अभाव में सिर्फ इतना कहना चाहता हूं कि उच्च पद पर रहते हुए सादगी जीवन कैसे जिया जा सकता है इसके आप एक सटीक उदाहरण हैं अकादमिक के बारे में सभी लोगों ने कहा जो एक चमकता सितारा है वो क्वाइन का एक साइड है दूसरा साइट यह भी है सर आपको दिल से सहस्त्र प्रणाम एवं ईश्वर से प्रार्थना है कि आपको लंबी एवं स्वस्थ जीवन दे और आपकी सभी मनोकामनाओं को परमात्मा पूरी करे जो परमात्मा आपके लिए उचित समझता है धन्यवाद ओवर टू मॉडरेटर Uh, so, over to you, Dr. Vipin. Vipin ji, you are mute. You are muted, uh, sir. So, you are muted.
Hello, am I audible now? Yes. Yes. So this is time for uh, thanks to the chair, Professor Sina, and the co-chair, uh, Dr. Prashant Khatri, for very well managing the session and running, uh, I mean, well on time and uh, providing enough time to the participants. And uh, there's enough time for discussion also. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, thanks, Prashant. Thank you. Thank you, Ji. When the next session starts at 2 or 2.15, uh, so uh, there is a slight update here. Mm. We will uh, break up for lunch now and meet again at 2 p.m. for the session, sir. At which time? 2 p.m. sir. 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we'll meet at 2 p.m. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much, sir. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Watch out our food. Sir, you have to wait for Wait, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Prasant ji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prasant, uh, Professor Thank you. Suna, sir. Thank you, Prasant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank Professor. you, Prasant. Thank you. Oh. At least we can know what is there in the food. <laughs> sure, sir. <laughs> Psychology, Mitrasa should be able to tell, sir. Uh -huh. yeah.